This video is sponsored by HelloFresh, bringing ingredients directly to your doorstep to make delicious and nutritious meals. You are now watching The Beach. Let's put it this way, 2D platformers were in a rough position after the fifth generation of gaming, 3D games were encouraged to showcase the advances in technology, while 2D games were often discouraged. While I do prefer 3D games, one can't replace the other. Just like how CGI shouldn't be a replacement for 2D animation. I said shouldn't, didn't stop Disney from doing it, but New Super Mario Bros. release at a perfect time when everyone and their mother were getting into gaming. Parents saw it as a game they could relate to, since they grew up playing Super Mario Bros., which had a domino effect, leading to the new generation of gaming, getting their introduction to gaming. You have to keep in mind, the Nintendo DS was an absolute phenomenon. They were accessible, inexpensive, of superb quality, and had an excellent library of games. It was also the introduction to gaming, not just for me, but for many of my friends as well. New Super Mario Bros. DS has definitely had an impact on me since it was my first mainline Mario game alongside Super Mario 64 DS. I have a lot of memories of playing this game as a kid on my DSi, and I remember playing it before school or playing it late at night when I wasn't supposed to, but I have a lot of memories with this game, and it remains one of my favorite 2D Mario games to this day. Even though the DS was more than capable of 3D games, New Super Mario Bros. showcased that there was still huge demand for 2D platformers, and since then, 2D platformers had a resurgence. Nowadays, it doesn't feel we get enough 3D platformers, but you'd be hard-pressed not to find a modern 2D platformer. New Super Mario Bros. did have a positive impact, but it also had a negative one. It's widely assumed that it led to the bland era of Mario. It just seemed every Mario game after wanted to be New Super Mario Bros. This was especially apparent with the RPGs, but even the games like Mario Party were hit hard. Going from something like Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door to Paper Mario Sticker Star was like going from Wagyu Steak garnished with edible gold with a side of caviar, to just bread and water. The bland era was mostly during the 3DS and Wii U era, but the effects are occasionally present even to this day. Considering the impact of New Super Mario Bros., revisiting it was quite intriguing. What was all the hype about? And was it actually a detriment to not just the Mario series, but Nintendo as well? New Super Mario Bros. was the first Mario game I ever played, and one of the first games I've played, period. And I do have many fond memories playing the game, but as with every retrospective, nostalgia will not play a factor. I don't tend to get very nostalgic over games and media, because I can always revisit them. Life experiences like my trip to Canada back in 2011, my elementary school experience minus Sean, my graduations, and my first time in Greece? Now that's what I get nostalgic for. Even my recent trip to Canada in December of 2022, I just have such fond memories of, and I'm getting nostalgic towards it already. Revisiting New Super Mario Bros. 17 years later was certainly interesting. How well has this not-so-new game held up? And more importantly, is it as stagnant as people make out the game to be? So the real question is, is New Super Mario Bros. true innovation, or did it just sell well? Cause you know what else sold well in the 80s? What? Our story begins with Mario or Luigi going on a walk with Princess Peach. They're just going for a nice morning walk when suddenly, lightning strikes the castle, only to then have Bowser Jr. capture Peach. That's right, after Super Mario Sunshine, he kept his word about wanting to fight that Mario again. And it's up to Mario and Luigi to save the day once again. Wouldn't you know it, it's the tried and true cliche Bowser Bad, Rescue Peach plotline that few mainline Mario games have escaped. If this were any other game, I would groan. But considering this was the first 2D Mario game in nearly a decade and a half, I understand why they kept things simple. And although a story is nice to have, it hardly matters in a platformer. Unless it's a certain platformer RPG hybrid. Gameplay-wise, New Super Mario Bros. is very much a Mario game. And right from the first level, the game does a great job showing you all the ropes. The Mario Brothers can run, jump, stomp on Goombas, stomp on Koopas, everything just like before. But the Mario Brothers have also learned some new tricks following the events of Super Mario 64 DS. They can triple jump, wall jump, 
and even Ground Pound, all very welcome additions which complement 2D Mario quite well. The Ground Pound was in Wario Land and Yoshi's Island before, so it's only natural to have it in a Mario game, and while the wall jump may make bottomless pits more forgiving, it does allow for more varied level design. The triple jump isn't as useful, but it looks super cool. I'll give it that. Unlike other Mario games, Mario and Luigi play identically, and you can choose to play as Luigi in single player by holding L and R before starting the game, which I always do since Luigi is clearly the better brother. The general control though is rock solid. Everything feels great and the physics are a bit more free than prior 2D Mario games, not to the point of feeling floaty, but they are far more refined than most of the other 2D Mario games. Controlling the Mario Brothers has never felt better in a 2D Mario game, although I will admit some additional moves would have been appreciated. Originally they were able to punch and kick, but that got scrapped from the beta. I'm assuming because it had the potential to make the game too easy, but the good news is that Mario and Luigi can power up to gain abilities, classic ones as well as some brand new ones. You have the Staples, the Superstar, Fire Flower, the Super Mushroom, they're all here, and they function exactly how they always have. I will say, I've been allured by the rainbow effect the Starman gives a brother. If there's a name for the Nintendo DS rainbow effect, I'd love to know about it, because it's going to be used for my Reverb Song album cover. The thing is, these are only the classic power-ups, but there are three additional new ones. The one new Super Mario Brothers wants you to know right away is the Mega Mushroom. It's on the box art, it's in the first level, it's gonna make Mario and Luigi huge! What it does is turn the brothers into an enormous Koopa slang machine. Also, granting full invincibility, I will say, it looks super cool, and when it's present, it's always fun to use. But unfortunately, it's highly underutilized, resorting to being nothing more than a giant gimmick. If the game had more levels surrounding this truffle of a Mario mushroom, it would live up to its potential. But as it stands, it's a flashy gimmick claiming to be grander than what it is. Like an old PSA about eating healthy school lunches instead of junk food, only to end up promoting unhealthy food anyway. I'm tired of candy, tired of gum, tired of hunger, and food that's no fun. I'm tired of pretending I don't like spaghetti, but school lunch keeps me roaring ready and rock steady. Pizza, spaghetti, burger. If anything though, the Mega Mushroom makes me feel empowered. It's so satisfying to smash anything in your way and watch everything go flying. It is temporary, of course, but it's still awesome. I just wish it was here more. But the other new quote-unquote power-up does the exact opposite. The Mini Mushroom shrinks the Mario Brothers down to a microscopic size. They gain the ability to jump higher, run faster, and even on water. And I just found out spikes can be dodged after 13 years. Yes, after playing this game for 13 years, I just found something new. He learns something new every day. But this power-up barely qualifies as one, because you can't defeat enemies unless you ground pound them, and just one hit will lead to your demise. The trade-off isn't even worth it. What, you can jump higher but remain incredibly vulnerable? This is hands down the worst power-up in the entire Mario series, and Nintendo knew it was bad too. There are sections that require mini Mario, and defeating two bosses with it will unlock World 4 and World 7, so it's really an extra challenge. I will admit, I played New Super Mario Bros. to the point where I know the game like a book. I can beat levels with just the mini mushroom, but all I feel is a sense of stress, considering I only have one chance, and that's the exact opposite of what a power-up should be. But funnily enough, the mini mushroom doesn't have as bad of a rep as the final new power-up. This is one polarizing power-up. The blue Koopa Shell. It allows the Mario Brothers to shell dash and gives them the abilities of Koopas. Also, enhanced swimming. It's a pretty rare power-up, only appearing in bonus question blocks and toad houses. Considering you can essentially become a Koopa, the shell can ricochet, which can cause you to bounce all over the place. But honestly, I absolutely love the blue shell. It does take some time to master, but once you do, it is awesome. You can take out nearly every enemy and just blast through levels. It's very similar to the Super Cape in that regard. It is hard to learn, but once you got the hang of it, you are going to be set. 
Though I will say, Super Mario 3D World handled this concept far better, but I still consider it to be the most underrated Mario power-up. The Mega Mushroom is gimmicky, and the Mini Mushroom is just bad, but the other power-ups are great. The game could have benefited from more of them though. This is one of the few 2D Mario games that doesn't have a flight power-up whatsoever, but regardless, the selection of power-ups isn't bad, but a bit underwhelming. New Super Mario Bros. has 8 worlds to explore, with over 80 levels. That's a pretty good amount, but how is the level design itself? The game starts off fairly standard. The first level showcases the basics, then the second level takes you underground, and the third level is a mushroom platforming stage, all followed by a fortress stage. But after the first four levels, things start to become truly new. New Super Mario Bros. barely gets credit for how creative it actually is. You'll have levels with bouncy mushrooms to jump off of, as well as moving ones, sometimes even tilting or shrinking. You'll also be dodging snowballs from snow spikes. There are just so many creative and cool levels in the game, you initially wouldn't expect. Underwater levels are my least favorite kind of levels, but this game managed to have some cool ones, some even filled with the scary eel Zunagis from Super Mario 64 and there's even a giant one that you'll need to avoid. And speaking of Super Mario 64, you'll also get the chance to ride Dory in some of the jungle levels, traversing across the poisonous purple water. The Mario Brothers also finally get to do some plumbing, and occasionally can traverse a sewer or a pipeline. These stages are a blast to play, and I especially love the one in World 7 with the Baby Wigglers. So many levels in the game introduce new and unique concepts, making them not only memorable, but more varied. Come to think of it, this game has some pretty distinct new enemies. They don't appear often, but it's always a treat finding them. Maybe there's a chance for Dr. Snailicorn and Dr. Mario World? Oh. Another area where the enemy variety really shines is, funnily enough, with the bosses. Mario games have notoriously lacked variety when it comes to bosses, especially in the succeeding new Super Mario Bros. games. It was cool seeing the Koopalings in Wii, but 2 and you? Yeah, you overdid it there. But in the original, we have a Monty Mole in a tank, a mummified Pokey, and even Petey! No, fortunately not that Petey, but my favorite by far is Lacka Thunder. This Lacka 2 looks straight out of the Mafia, striking lightning so bright, he needs shades. It's a real shame most of these bosses have never been seen again, but it also goes to show how much variety there is here, especially when it comes to new enemies. Considering the new Super Mario Bros. series is ironically known for stagnation, it makes it even more crazy. I do wish they took more than just three hits to take out, but that's just been a problem with Mario bosses since Mario 3. The levels are fun and creative, and the bosses are as well but the level design itself isn't based solely on cool gimmicks, because the design itself is also great. This game came out just two years after the e-reader levels in Super Mario Advance 4, so it's not too surprising. Not to mention Nintendo are experts when it comes to level design. Your main goal is to reach the flagpole, but there are also secret exits and star coins to find. This encourages exploration and gives the levels far more depth, and I'm always a huge fan. Never did I find the star coins or secret exits to be hidden cryptically either. They were all in places that made sense, and there's even a few rewards for star coins too. You can unlock toad houses with them, which shockingly enough, are ran by Toadsworth. You know, the best toad, the one Nintendo abandoned. Though to be fair, if I saw Paper Mario sticker star unfold, I would have ran too. The toad houses give you items or one-ups, and are mostly based on just luck. So unfortunately, they aren't mini-games, but they can come in handy, and you can also get some neat wallpapers for the bottom screen. The secret exits unlock warp cannons, allowing you to skip entire worlds, so if you wanted to, you could beat the game in probably a little over an hour. They also unlock alternate paths, which sometimes have bonus levels or toad houses. From a design standpoint, New Super Mario Bros. seems nearly perfect, my main criticisms are just the lack of varied power-ups and the underwhelming new ones, but there are a few more criticisms that need to be addressed. The timer and score should not be here. The score is useless, and the timer is unnecessary. It's a relic of the past that just puts you under unnecessary pressure. Not actual pressure since you'll likely never run out of time, but it's more of a minor annoyance. And to save the game, you'll need to clear a fortress or a castle, or buy a toad house. Now to be fair, 
You should be able to clear at least a fortress in a play session, but you can unlock the ability to save at any time once you beat the game. Now, I don't know if it was to make the game more challenging, but since when is saving progress whenever you want to a reward, especially in a handheld game? Again, these aspects aren't even a big deal, but they are worth bringing up. But overall, the gameplay is outstanding. But how has the presentation fared? New Super Mario Bros. does something interesting when it comes to the visual presentation. It's a mixture of 3D models and pre-rendered sprites. Most of the enemies are sprites, but they still look pretty good. Same for most of the power-ups. I'm assuming this was done to ensure the game would run at a smooth 60 frames per second, and if that's the case, it was absolutely worth the trade-off. The Mario Brothers bosses and a few of the enemies are 3D models. It makes the main characters stand out a bit more, which makes sense considering the focus is on them. But regardless, Nintendo handled the limitations of the DS brilliantly, and the game still looks quite nice. The world themes, on the other hand, are stale now, considering we've seen them a trillion times afterwards. But considering just prior Mario games, the world themes are actually quite nice. I especially like the jungle theme. Super Mario Bros. 3 and Super Mario Land 2 still had better locations, but I'm willing to be a bit more forgiving here, because remember, this was sort of a reboot for 2D Mario. I can't forgive it in succeeding entries though. The overall visual presentation is pretty good, but music on the other hand could be the test. I'm not a huge fan of the signature bacapella found in the new games, but shockingly enough, the soundtrack here is excellent. I like the buzz if they're used occasionally, but that's not even the defining element of the music. It sort of has a retro Game Boy sound to it only found here, and all of the music is original as well. The succeeding games reused a lot of music, but mostly from Wii. Most of the music here is still exclusive to DS, and it sounds great. Sound effects are also satisfying as well. When it comes to the presentation, New Super Mario Bros. manages to do an excellent job handling the limitations and provides something still nice even to this day. Goes to show a good art direction goes a long way. New Super Mario Bros. has 8 worlds with nearly 80 levels. As I said before, if you want to warp, you can beat the game quickly, but if you're going for 100%, it's much more fulfilling. Getting all the star coins, finding all the secret exits, it'll probably take around 10 to 20 hours to do so, probably less if you know the ropes like I do, but here's something you may not know. Once you beat the game, by pressing LRLRXXYY at the pause screen, you can unlock the secret challenge mode that doesn't allow you to backtrack. Just like the first Super Mario Brothers, I don't often play it because I didn't find it to be that much more challenging, but it's a nice addition. That's already a lot of content, but there's even more content beyond the main game. Many games from Super Mario 64 DS return here, along with a few new ones. They vary in depth, but they're so much fun to play. Organizing bob and whack a monty Mole are some of my favorites, but I don't even want to know how much time I spent playing Picture Poker with Luigi. I played it so much, I think I got the max number of stars. This is why I have a problem even to this day. And I'm not the only one. The added minigames in New Super Mario Bros. are such a welcome bonus. I especially love Luigi's Casino and the Wanted Poster minigames. It taught me how to gamble when I was five and how to spot a criminal. These games are great overall, and I'm really happy they were added here, even if I hardly play them anymore. The minigames are an excellent addition, but they are mostly from Super Mario 64 DS, albeit graphically enhanced. But there is another mode exclusive to the game, being Mario vs. Luigi. My goodness, I cannot tell you how much fun this mode is. You and a friend compete for stars and go completely against cooperating. Think of it like the battle mode of Mario Kart, but in a 2D Mario game. There are five levels specifically made for it, and they even have blue Koopas to jump on which give you the blue shell power-up, and you only need one game card to play it. The good old days of download play. I remember back in elementary school, my friends Shawnee Boy and Billy put me up against another new Super Mario Bros. expert and bet on who would win. I'm guessing they gambled with Luigi too. The new Super Mario Bros. series is very well known for its co-op multiplayer. However, the first entry in the series did something very different by having the competitive mode, Mario vs. Luigi, and I have tons of fond memories playing it when I was a kid. Thankfully, I haven't joined the, uh, the dark side behind the alleys of Luigi's Casino, because I was too busy knocking the ever-loving stars out of my friends. I mean, they do call me Star Chronics for a reason, you know. 
It's a shame this mode never returned in future entries because it would complement co-op very well and it could bring more variety. But even with that said, it's definitely a highlight here and it's one of my favorite aspects about this game, 100%. While it's not as feasible playing DS games multiplayer nowadays since the heyday has been long gone, it's still a blast to play, and I hope that one day, we'll see a re-release of the game with online play. But even if you disregard the minigames in Mario vs. Luigi, there is an ample amount of content. It would have been cool if they had a co-op mode though. I replay a lot of GameCube, DS, and Wii games, and it always amazes me how jam-packed they are with content. F-Zero GX is another example that came to mind. It really goes to show that the 6th and 7th generation of gaming were peak, especially for Nintendo, because these games had everything and then some. So far we've established New Super Mario Bros. has excellent gameplay, creative new ideas, a good presentation, and a toad house worth of content, but it does occasionally falter with underutilized or bad new power-ups, and it does retain a few archaic elements. So what's the verdict? I had an absolute blast going back to New Super Mario Bros. I was well aware of what to expect, considering I've beaten the game 100% many times, but what I got out of it more than ever is that New Super Mario Bros. is indeed a fresh new experience, and it often doesn't get the credit it deserves. If it were called Super Mario Bros. 4 or Super Mario Bros. Forever, I guarantee you it would be seen as one of the best 2D Mario games ever made, but unfortunately, it's tied to a series that has two of the most unoriginal games I've ever played, and it did start an unfortunate trend. Too many succeeding games pretty much just wanted to be New Super Mario Bros., and they only took the more generic aspects from the game. I also think it started the trend of Nintendo focusing heavily on 2D platformers, especially during the 3DS and Wii U era. The question is, if I could go back in time, would I prevent New Super Mario Bros. from happening to stop the domino effect? Considering where Mario games are now, I wouldn't. Games like Super Mario Odyssey, the Mario and Rabbids games, Luigi's Mansion 3, and a few others are some of the greatest and most creative Mario games of all time, and Nintendo is willing to take far more creative risks nowadays. And honestly, New Super Mario Bros. is actually a very creative game that offered a lot new. It was my first Mario game. It made me a Mario fan for life. I loved playing the multiplayer mode with my brother. <laughs> there were a lot of fights because of it, the Mario and Luigi mode. I loved the mini game modes as well. And honestly, it's a staple of my childhood. And without that game, I don't think I'd be the Mario fan that I am today. Uh, and while I still have a distaste towards the new Super Mario Brothers series at the moment, it doesn't take away from the fact that this game was really instrumental to making me the Mario fan that I am today. Don't let the succeeding games like 2 and You sour your impressions, because New Super Mario Bros. still remains excellent and is well deserving of the new moniker. It's an excellent return to form and was a true evolution for 2D Mario. The only thing that's aged is just the 2D Mario gameplay itself. 2D platformers are better than ever now. You might be spoiled after playing Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze or Rayman Legends going to this game, but it's still a blast to play, even if it isn't as sophisticated. New Super Mario Bros., a series that's gained the reputation of being monotonous and frankly not new. Pretty ironic considering new is in the title of every game. There are two main factors why New Super Mario Bros. as a series has gotten this reputation. 2012 gave us not you, but two New Super Mario Bros. games. Neither of these games did anything to evolve 2D Mario, and barely did anything new, but the second factor is the domino effect that happened in the Mario series. During the early 2010s, Mario games played it way too safe and didn't take creative risks. Everything was tied to New Super Mario Bros., and this was especially apparent with the RPGs. The game that's often pinpointed as a direct cause of Market Pantry Mario is none other than New Super Mario Bros. Wii. At face value, it does make sense. Succeeding games often use elements found in Wii, and two games were essentially built from it. But the thing is, New Super Mario Bros. Wii shouldn't be categorized as unoriginal like 2 and U, because it did a lot to provide a truly new experience. It often doesn't get the credit it deserves, and I'm here to defend my stance that it is indeed a creative and great game. 
And this is coming from a guy who thrives on not defending Nintendo. So you know, this is serious business. And to make sure you know I'm mega super ultra serious, I'm joined by the one and only Star Chronix. Sounds good to me, Dimitri. New Super Mario Bros. Wii was my first home console game, and coincidentally is my favorite 2D Mario game of all time. It's about time we discuss such a fantastic entry into such a highly controversial series. Let's dive in. Great to have you on here. Let's party like it's 2009. Let's a go. Our story begins with Mario and friends celebrating Princess Peach's birthday. They may not be celebrating with cardboard and frosting and four ply, but in a role reversal of the century, Peach is the one getting a cake, not Mario. And it's a massive cake too. Now when it comes to birthdays, I like to celebrate in a more reserved way. Don't need candles and cake, just need- Oh my goodness! Those aren't cake toppers! Those are the Koopalings! Nowadays, getting excited to see the Koopalings is like getting excited to listen to NPR. But in 2009, this was a big deal. The last mainline Mario game they appeared in prior to Wii was Super Mario World. With a few spin-off exceptions such as Yoshi Safari, Mario & Luigi Superstar Saga, and even Hotel Mario, they were kinda in hibernation. It was incredible seeing them again, returning with modern 3D designs, and even Bowser Jr. is in on the action. This is why I always consider Bowser Jr. to be part of the Koopalings. I know you can claim you aren't the father Bowser to weasel your way out of Mari, but we know the truth. Despite the story being the same as always, it's a fun and unique take on the traditional story. But as I always say, a newer, interesting story is nice to have, but the gameplay is the most important factor. New Super Mario Bros. Wii is at its core, similar to the original on DS. The general movement is the same, but it's refined to feel even better. Mario can now spin jump for extra airtime and to take out enemies in one hit. Unfortunately, you can't jump on spiked enemies, but it's a great move to have and makes the control a lot more versatile. A few moves and mechanics require motion controls, and personally, I love them. But the option for classic controller support would have been nice. Wii is structured like a traditional Mario game, meaning it's all about stomping Goombas, kicking Koopas, and using power-ups. It's a formula that's proven to work, though I will say, 2D Mario now needs to evolve. New Super Mario Bros. Wii was released in 2009 meaning it was before Donkey Kong Country Returns and Tropical Freeze, Rayman Origins and Legends, and pretty much every modern 2D platformer. But even though the core gameplay is the same as it's always been, there are many new mechanics introduced. Looking back at the original new Super Mario Bros., I gotta be honest, the new power-ups weren't that great. The Mega Mushroom is a blast to use, but it's incredibly situational. And the Mini Mushroom? Wait, that's a power-up? The only new power-up I found to be excellent was the blue shell, and I'm willing to stand on that hill and say it's one of Mario's best power-ups. Those who despise it likely don't even know how to use it. The only power-ups you'll primarily use are the blue shell and the fire flower, but New Super Mario Bros. Wii introduced three new power-ups that aren't just good, but are incredible. The fire flower is given a counterpart that's quite literally the polar opposite, the ice flower. While it first appeared in Mario & Luigi Partners in Time and then was given a completely different functionality in Super Mario Galaxy, this is my favorite form of the Ice Flower. Mario and friends can throw snowballs to freeze enemies. You can take out four more enemies than you can with the standard Fire Flower, but you'll need to throw the frozen enemy in order to defeat them. If there are many enemies, the Fire Flower is ideal since they can be taken out instantly, but the Ice Flower can take out more enemies even if it takes a bit more work. The Fire and Ice Flower have different strengths and weaknesses, each giving them a purpose. Now that's what I call good game design. Most Mario games have a power-up that grants flight or hovering, so it was a bit odd not seeing a power-up like that in New Super Mario Bros. But that didn't fly past Wii. The Propeller Mushroom is the new flight power-up, and is what I'd consider to be Wii's defining power-up. By shaking the Wii Remote, Mario and friends can reach new heights. It's different than the Raccoon Suit or Cape Feather, as it's designed around vertical movement. It's very useful in the tower levels. While the Raccoon Suit is my favorite, the Propeller Mushroom is still a great power-up. There are so many cool Mario power-ups, and choosing a favorite has proven to be a challenge, but after analyzing them, I've come to the conclusion that the best Mario power-up of all time is the Penguin Suit. 
It's an absolute powerhouse with incredible versatility. You can slide down frozen slopes and skim across water, walk on ice without slipping, you can swim substantially better, and you can even throw snowballs. It does sort of antiquate the ice flower, but it's somewhat rare while the ice flower is common. The only issue? I found it to look a bit too silly with the overalls. All the other suit power-ups don't incorporate overalls and frankly look better. But man, that is such a minor nitpick in the grand scheme of this awesome power-up. The rest of the power-ups are returning items, but although he's not a power-up, we managed to hatch a series favorite into the game. Yoshi makes his grand return in a 2D Mario game after Super Mario World nearly two decades prior in pink, light blue, yellow, and green. Not just red, gold, and green. Oh, and blue. Only this time, he can flutter jump and hatch power-ups. The Yoshi levels are some of the best in the game, but bafflingly, you can't take him out of a level. I'm assuming they wanted the Yoshi levels to be a highlight, and while they certainly are, I wish Yoshi was far more utilized. Wii has excellent movement and stellar power-ups, but if the level design is subpar, they won't matter much. Let's take a look at the level design. When looking at the level design in New Super Mario Bros. Wii, it's clear to see that the levels are longer, larger, and more open for the player to explore. This was done to accommodate multiple players, but also to allow the players the opportunity to explore and look for secrets hidden within the levels. In some games, designing levels for multiple players can be detrimental to the game. Kirby Star Allies, for example, has a lot of areas in levels that are so empty, and in games like New Super Mario Bros. U, the secrets feel so cheap and placed in either broad daylight or in overly hidden secret areas that require mini Mario. But even though the levels in Wii are larger, they're designed very well and have a lot of depth to them. There are many star coins and hidden exits to find, so the goal isn't just reaching the flagpole. There's also a good balance of challenge and accessibility. The game is not old school hard, like Super Mario Bros. The Lost Levels, but there are quite a few challenging levels, especially the notorious World 9-7. Nowadays, I can breeze through these levels, but it did take a lot of practice for me to get there. Games nowadays have become too easy, so it's refreshing playing a game with a good amount of challenge. And looking back on it now, the way that the levels in New Super Mario Bros. Wii are designed to be progressively difficult as the game progresses is so smooth and so balanced. It never feels like they're throwing you in the deep end. But my favorite thing about the level design in New Super Mario Bros. Wii is how most levels utilize new and existing concepts. World 1, for example, serves as an introduction to the basics. The first level is designed around the propeller mushroom, while the second underground level introduces players to the ice flower. They do a great job getting players familiar with the new power-ups, but where the levels shine the most is when they're designed around enemies or a mechanic. World 2, the desert world, brings a lot of variety to the rather dry desert theme. You'll be throwing barrels, navigating through a dark cavern, and bringing light to a dark temple. World 3, the ice world, introduces the penguin suit, and you'll be sliding down slopes, avoiding the new Cooligan penguin enemies. And once you reach the jungles of World 5, you'll be jumping on gigantic wigglers and flying on stingrays. Most of the levels have a defining mechanic and it brings a lot of variety to the game. Not only does it make the levels memorable, but more varied and exciting. Starman, that's exactly how I feel as well. Each level has a mechanic themed around it, making the levels memorable and varied. New Super Mario Bros. Wii is seemingly a perfect game based on what we've covered, but like any game, it does have some shortcomings. The timer is completely unnecessary. There's no need for it. It doesn't add challenge and is archaic. Boss fights have been a consistent issue in Mario games, and the main problem is that they're too short. Three hits and you're done. But unlike a game like New Super Mario Bros. 2 which had repetitive and boring boss fights, the boss fights here are a blast. The Koopalings have two phases. The fortress fights are standard, but the castle fights have Kamek power them up. My favorite are Iggy's Chain Chomp ride and Ludwig's Elevator ride from hell. Nowadays, I know we like a book, so these fights are a cakewalk, but by far the best boss fights in the game are the Bowser Jr. airship fights. The first one encourages you to fly and spin drill the brat to his demise, but I like to go the Donkey Kong 94 route and throw the propeller blocks at him but the World 6 airship fight is hands down the most fun Mario boss of all time. Mario gets his own clown car, and you essentially defeat Junior by playing bumper cars. This would make for a great minigame. Really, the only criticisms I have is that they take three hits and are a bit easy. 
All these criticisms are exempt from the incredible final boss. The game did release in 2009, but if you've never played it, I won't spoil how epic the final boss truly is. My last gripe with the gameplay involves the most pointless missions I've ever seen in a game. Each world has a mission where you can escort Toad to the goal, and by doing so, you can get more 1-ups and a Toad House. You can already get a Toad House by reaching the flagpole when the last two numbers on the timer match. Now sure, these are completely optional, but they are incredibly pointless. The Nabbit chases in New Super Mario Bros. U, on the other hand, are a blast. Maybe if the Toad missions were like this, I'd be more entertained. Alright, you greasy little meatball. Let's do this. Why are you pacing around like a buffoon? Follow me! I want a piggyback ride! I'm not giving you a piggyback ride! Let's go! But I want one! Okay, fine. I hope Peach knows how far I'll go for her. Are we there yet? Not yet, buddy. Are we there yet? No, we aren't. Are we there yet? Look! Close salami, your darn mouth! Otherwise, I'll throw you into the freaking lava! You can't tell me what to do! Toad, look out! I got this. Don't ever do that again! I promise. Perhaps we need Mario's time machine to prevent it from ever happening again! Other than those, New Super Mario Bros. Wii has stellar gameplay. The presentation of New Super Mario Bros. games is often a common critique, most notably with 2 and U. And considering those games are derived from Wii, let's take a look at the presentation and see if it has similar issues. The presentation of Wii is a complete revamp of the original on DS. The art style is similar, but it's no longer a hybrid of 3D models and sprites, which makes sense considering the Wii has far more power. Considering we've seen the style of Wii time and time again, it's not the most exciting to look at now, but Wii still manages to have a nice presentation. Unfortunately, all the themes are from the original DS game. It's disappointing not seeing new world themes, but they do have improvements. The snow world has overcast skies, and as you progress, the skies get more gray, and the mountain world has a subtle Japan theme to it. I will say World 9 was a huge missed opportunity, and I would love if the levels incorporated the Rainbow Star theme, but the presentation looks quite good. Music, on the other hand, still holds up very well. Unlike 2 and you, we has an original soundtrack with most being new compositions. Some of the standouts for me were the map themes of World 3, 8, and 9, the level theme of World 8, and of course the excellent final boss music. It's not my favorite Mario soundtrack ever. That goes to Mario Kart Arcade Grand Prix, but the overall presentation is quite good. New Super Mario Bros. Wii has nearly 80 levels to explore, each having three star coins. You'll need to collect all of them to unlock the levels in World 9. There's a lot of content and a lot of replayability. No need for free updates. Unlike the other New Super Mario Bros. games, New Super Mario Bros. Wii does not have an additional single player mode of any kind, but it does have a major new addition that essentially defines the game. New Super Mario Bros. Wii was revealed back at E3 2009. And right from the get-go, the huge mechanic and selling point of the game was the four-player multiplayer. The DS entry had a multiplayer option, which was Mario vs. Luigi, where you and a friend compete for the most stars on five unique levels. But you never had the option to play the main game cooperatively. New Super Mario Bros. Wii, on the other hand, gives players the ability to jump in right from the start with up to four players. While yes, Nintendo made the weird decision to use Buck and Berry and a la Gold instead of Wario and Waluigi, it is nice to see some new playable characters. Buck and Barry and a la Gold aside, the multiplayer is an absolute blast. It often gets criticism for being chaotic, which it definitely can be, but that mainly applies to four-player multiplayer. Three is manageable, and two is perfect. My brother and I used to fight like barbarians for over a decade. It's shocking that either of us made it out alive, and New Super Mario Bros. Wii could be the reason why either of us are still here. We'd take a break from beating the ever-living hell out of each other to play the game. We primarily played the story mode, but there are two additional modes. Free For All is a collection of all the levels you cleared in the story mode, and it's essentially like Versus mode in Mario Kart, and Coin Battle has you compete for the highest amount of coins. There are even a few new levels specifically made for Coin Battle. These modes are nice to have, but regardless, New Super Mario Bros. Wii has so much content that I'm still engaged with the game nearly 12 years later. 
So far we've established New Super Mario Bros. Wii has excellent gameplay, amazing power-ups, stellar level design, a nice presentation, and the game-changing addition of co-op. Even with its flaws, it's an excellent experience. So what's the verdict? New Super Mario Bros. Wii is a phenomenal game that brings the legendary platforming genre to a whole new generation. With the Wii's casual audience combined with the older fans of the 2D games, New Super Mario Bros. Wii sold a crazy 30.32 million copies worldwide, making it the 19th best-selling video game of all time. If you skipped out on this game just because of the impressions of New Super Mario Bros. 2 and U, I highly recommend you go back and give it a shot. You'll find yourself having a lot more fun than you realize, and with the 4-player multiplayer, it may be very chaotic, but it adds to the fun, trust me. It is a worthwhile experience. Thank you so much, Dimitri, for having me on your channel. I'm very appreciative for the opportunity, and I hope you all enjoyed the video. This project has been several years in the making, and I cannot believe it's finally coming out. Thank you all so much, and I hope you have a great day. Great to have you on as always, Starboy. Water levels stink. The sun is angry. New Super Mario Bros. Wii is treasure. New Super Mario Bros. Wii is my favorite 2D Mario game, and one of my favorite games ever, and it isn't based on nostalgia. New Super Mario Bros. U is fun, but is essentially Wii all over again, and not in a good way. It's like if Wii had a nasty hangover nearly three years later, it did nothing to innovate and its creative concepts are far and few between. And New Super Mario Bros. 2 is just Wii, with a coin gimmick and the raccoon suit. From the addition of co-op, the excellent new power-ups, the great levels, and the return of things such as the Koopalings and Yoshi, New Super Mario Bros. Wii goes beyond just having a gimmick, and is truly an experience. There is a lot I have to say about New Super Mario Bros. 2. So much to the point, where it probably would be a good idea to have lunch before diving into the game, I could just get some fast food. But when I really think about it, the only benefit is getting food fast. And unfortunately, fast food is usually quite unhealthy. But the good news is, quick and easy meals do not need to be unhealthy. And HelloFresh is exactly the innovation the world of food is needed. HelloFresh delivers fresh ingredients right to your door. With 40 different weekly meals to choose from, there's something here for everyone. You're not only getting the convenience of having ingredients delivered right to your door, but they're also portioned in accordance with the recipes. That way you won't end up with an excess of ingredients that you may not even use. Selecting meals is also customizable. If you're cutting back on calories, they offer low calorie meals. Or if you're aiming to increase your protein intake, you can use the protein smart tag while selecting meals. Even before the sponsorship, I've been a big fan of HelloFresh. My family and I have used HelloFresh before, and it's been a great experience. My grandma lives in the countryside without many restaurants or grocery stores in close distance, but HelloFresh has made it incredibly easy to have delicious and nutritious meals easily accessible. The recipes are super easy to follow since everything is pre-proportioned, and not only is it convenient, but it's also affordable. Compared to dining in at restaurants, HelloFresh is 70% cheaper, meaning that you can still have quality meals rather than just going for a bowl of cereal or instant noodles. And guess what? It gets even cheaper when you use my promo code. To try HelloFresh, just click the link below for a 50% discount and free shipping. It has been an incredible experience for me, and it will be for you as well. <laughs> In 2010, Miyamoto stated both 3D and 2D Mario games were coming to the 3DS. What came out of the 3D Mario game was none other than Super Mario 3D Land, a different yet familiar take on 3D Mario that fully took advantage of the 3DS. At the time, 3DS games were all about the 3D, and for a 2D Mario game, I thought it would be a great idea to resurrect ideas from the cancelled Virtual Boy Mario Land. But unfortunately, nothing even remotely similar to any Super Mario Land games made its way into New Super Mario Bros. 2. But it did have something golden setting it apart from other games. This game heavily marketed the major focus on coins. You don't see poor people doing this! The secondary objective of the game is to collect one million of them. It was certainly intriguing, but how did the game hold up? The story in New Super Mario Bros. 2 
is one of the deepest stories in the entire Mario series. Bowser sends in millions of coins into the Mushroom Kingdom to create hyperinflation, essentially making him worthless. His goal is to have his own currency, Koopa Coin, become the dominant one, so the Mushroom Kingdom could become Bowser's Kingdom. It's up to Mario and Luigi to use their powers of their companion, Game Boy Light, to mine natural resources to create a currency, backed by gold, to regain power of the Mushroom Kingdom. Okay, that was a joke, but the story I literally made up in less than two minutes is way more interesting than what they actually went with. Cue the ICQ. Uh -oh. The Koopalinks kidnap Peach because Bowser told them to, and it's up to Mario and Luigi to save her. The only interesting thing here is that Bowser Jr. oddly isn't here at all. Maybe this took place before the other new Super Mario Bros. games, but considering the theme of coins, wouldn't it make sense to, you know, have a villain obsessed with coins? Six golden coins? <laughs> Having Wario as the villain, or even appearing in any capacity, would have been perfect. But no, this is a modern Mario game, so Bowser has to be the villain. It would have been nice to have a new story and a different villain, but the story or lack thereof will not make or break a 2D Mario game. What will make or break the game is the gameplay, levels, and locations. The gameplay in New Super Mario Bros. 2 is identical to the first game. It looks exactly like Wii, but you can't spin jump. Apparently, it is absolutely immoral to designate the spin jump to the R button. Best not to have it at all. I'm guessing this was a decision made by the same freak who only allowed players to turn off the one button spin jump by using a cheat code in New Super Mario Bros. U Deluxe. This game fits the theme of 2012 perfectly and devoutly follows the idea of YOLO. Only this time, it stands for, you obviously lack originality. Let's take a look at the power-ups. The raccoon suit from Super Mario Bros. 3 Returns, functioning just like it did before. It was so weird in Super Mario 3D Land that they brought back the Tanuki suit, but you couldn't even fly with it. They really should have brought back Rabbit Mario from Super Mario Land 2, as that power-up was designed just for hovering. With the raccoon suit here, it is a great power-up. I love the raccoon suit, and it's easily the best flight power-up in any Mario game. A power-up like the propeller suit is primarily useful for vertical movement, you have the squirrel suit which is a complete opposite being used primarily for horizontal movement, and the cape from Super Mario World, well that's highly overpowered. The raccoon suit is versatile, but not overpowered because it has a flight meter, which is why I love it so much. The Mega and Mini Mushroom also return here, and the Mega Mushroom is elusive in this game. And the Mini Mushroom? Well that still remains only a key to get star coins and find secret exits. The thing is, these are the only power-ups in the game, the Fire Flower and Raccoon Suit being the only ones you'll use frequently. Why not have the return of the actual Tanuki Suit and Hammer Suit, as well as some new power-ups? Actually, there is a new power-up, but it's only useful for one level. You've heard of Buckenberry, and now it's time for a la gold to shine. The Gold Flower transforms Mario and Luigi into perfect Mario Kart candidates, with Mario being gold and Luigi being silver. You can unleash extremely powerful fireballs that turn bricks into coins and damage pretty much every enemy. It's a blast to use, but considering how powerful it is, it's only good for one level. And that's a blessing in disguise because the difficulty, or lack thereof, is one of the biggest issues with New Super Mario Bros. 2. This game goes out of its way to be as easy as possible. Difficulty is subjective, but what's not subjective is that it's harder to reach the game over screen than it is to beat this game. Coins will still give you an extra life after collecting a hundred of them, and considering the sheer abundance of coins, it wouldn't be surprising to have over a thousand lives by the end of the game. But it doesn't end there. The levels are well designed and are fun to play, but almost all of them lack challenge and would have greatly benefited from more obstacles and enemies. The game is still fun, but it does get very close to being so easy to the point of being boring. I think you can gather that New Super Mario Bros. 2 feels no different than the first two games, with very few new mechanics. But the thing is, we haven't gotten to the golden elephant in the room, the coins. Levels are absolutely bursting with them. Almost all the new mechanics surround the coin gimmick too. By hitting a multi-coin block enough times, Mario and Luigi can wear a gold block, giving them up to 100 coins while also serving as an extra hit. Jumping through a gold ring turns all enemies into gold and can change their function. Jumping on a gold Goomba gives you more coins. Finding a gold Koopa won't only give you memories of the forgotten yet lovable yellow Koopa from Super Mario World, 
but they'll leave a trail of coins behind. And if you hated Hammer Brothers and Lakitu before, you'll love them here, as their only goal is to make it rain. You'll also find dozens of coins randomly bursting out of pipes and scattered throughout the levels. These mechanics are fun. It's satisfying to collect coins, and seeing how the enemies behave when turned golden is interesting. You may be asking yourself, there's probably a specific reason why there are so many coins, and they likely have a major purpose in the game. And that is where the demise of New Super Mario Bros. 2 begins. There's never a reason explained to why there are so many coins, and not only that, but the coins barely do anything. All they do is give you extra lives, and if you do reach the goal of collecting 1 million of them, you'll be greeted to the lamest reward in gaming history. When I think of coins, I would at least think of something like a shop to spend them in. That way these golden gimmicks would actually have a purpose. Super Mario Odyssey was the very first mainline Mario game to make coins function like currency, and you can buy items and costumes for Mario. That would have been great here. Even Super Mario Land 2 did something different with the coins, where they're used in the casino zone to earn extra lives and power-ups. So essentially, the coins in New Super Mario Bros. 2 are nothing more than a gimmick, bringing nothing of substance to the game. This is exactly why the term gimmick usually has a negative connotation. We've established that the game is fun with great level design, but it all falls flat because of just how easy the game is, as well as the main new mechanic amounting to nothing. And let me tell you straight up, I'm going to be even harsher on the presentation. As I stated before, this game looks identical to New Super Mario Bros. Wii. That wouldn't be such an issue if the locations were more varied. This game uses the same locations from the first two games, and they look exactly the same as well. The theming isn't the main problem. You can take existing themes and do interesting things with them. Let's use Super Mario Odyssey as an example. That game has kingdoms based on common Mario themes, such as grassy plains, the desert, snow, and the beach. But all of them are memorable because each theme has a unique twist. The Sand Kingdom takes inspiration from Mexico, complete with a colorful town and Sugar Skull residence. Even something as basic as the red sand gives it an identity. Applying that to a 2D Mario game could be as simple as just changing the background. Super Mario Land 2 managed to have very unique locations, and that game didn't even have color. New Super Mario Bros. 2 has almost 100 levels, and only two locations in the game managed to be even somewhat memorable, those being the sunset and night levels. Why not have a world based on those? The locations here are incredibly bland, and there's no attempt to make them look even somewhat original. On a more positive note, the new enemies look very cool, the Bone Goombas and Piranha Plants being my favorites, and the gold enemies look nice as well, but the overall visual presentation is forgettable. Oh, and about the 3D effect? It's as useful as Joy-Cons. All it does is blur out the background. There are zero mechanics that take advantage of the 3D, but perhaps the worst aspect of the presentation is the lack of an original soundtrack. There are only three new songs in the game used for the maps of the three special worlds. The rest is either remixed Mario music or from New Super Mario Bros. Wii. And to be honest, it sounds worse in some cases. You're probably aware of the bop ba sound effects used in the soundtrack of every new Super Mario Bros. game. They're added to the soundtrack to have enemies dance to the music. Regardless of what you think of them, they're used somewhat sparingly and accent the music. But here, the main theme is literally made entirely out of boss. Have a listen. <laughs> If that isn't Bacapella, I don't know what is. Yeah. I don't think this game is gonna win any awards for the soundtrack. Perhaps maybe a Golden Raspberry, but that's kinda it. Needless to say, the presentation is incredibly lazy, and I don't like it. It's ba ba bad With the main campaign being a rehash, the defining new mechanic resorting to nothing, and a presentation that's as tasty as cold french fries, this should be the point to deem the game as a lost cause, but as with all new Super Mario Bros. games, there are a few side modes here. The game has co-op multiplayer, but only for two players, and it works just how you would expect it to. The main issue I have with it is that it requires both players to own a copy of New Super Mario Bros. 2. The Mario vs. Luigi mode in the first game only required one game card, and to be honest, I found it more fun. You also shouldn't expect Luigi to teach you gambling in 3D, but you can rank up coins to gamble with, in the coin rush mode. Your goal is to play through three different stages to get as many coins as possible within 100 seconds. 
This mode is, how can I put this? This mode is not just great, but the best thing about the game, the main campaign lacked challenge, but there's actually a good amount of challenge here. This mode was so much fun that perhaps it inspired New Super Luigi U to use the 100 second time limit for all the levels. This was also one of the very first Nintendo games to have paid DLC, or really DLC at all. For the price of $2.50 USD each, you could purchase new Coin Rush packs. These will not affect the final verdict, but are worth bringing up. Unlike the randomly selected default Coin Rush levels, these have three new levels. I didn't get every Coin Rush pack, but the three I played the most, I got dozens of hours out of. New Super Mario Bros. 2 is notoriously easy, but oh my gosh, some of these new levels are completely unforgiving. The Nerve Rack pack isn't too difficult, but it does require quick reflexes. The Gold Classics pack contains remakes of levels from the first Super Mario Bros. and Super Mario Bros. 3. It was a free download for quite some time too, but by far the most interesting pack is the Impossible pack. To this day, these are the hardest Mario levels. If you're up for an extreme challenge, these levels are for you. Coin Rush is a blast to play, and I'd love to see it return in the future. So far we've established New Super Mario Bros. 2 severely lacks challenge, originality, and it has a lazy presentation. But the Coin Rush mode is a blast to play, and the levels are fun and well designed. So what's a verdict? Do I even need to say it? I think it's quite obvious that New Super Mario Bros. 2 is tragically not as good as it could have been. What, were you expecting me to deem the game as trash? Here's the thing, the game itself compared to other Mario games is derivative, stagnant, and mediocre. It barely added anything new to the series. Going from something grand to mediocre is indeed a bad thing, but at its core, New Super Mario Bros. 2 is a continuation of New Super Mario Bros., and if you love that game, you'll at least find some fun here. I'd be lying if I said I didn't have any fun with the game, as I put many hours into it. It's also pretty satisfying to collect the coins, even though they resort to nothing. I somehow managed to get almost 200 hours out of the game. Not counting technical limitations and accounting for creativity and innovation, this is certainly one of the worst mainline Mario games. The only games inferior to it are Super Mario Run because of the stupid always online requirement, and Super Mario Bros. The Lost Levels. Funnily enough, New Super Mario Bros. 2 and Super Mario Bros. The Lost Levels have a lot in common. They're by far the most derivative Mario games out there, adding next to nothing to the series. The only difference is the polar opposite difficulty, where New Super Mario Bros. 2 is too easy, while Lost Levels is too difficult. I stated that I got hours of this game, and it's the definition of a guilty pleasure. This game is highly replayable, especially when it comes to collecting star coins, and if you do want to go for that million coin challenge, it's fun to do. I'm well aware that there are many better Mario games out there, but at the very least, New Super Mario Bros. 2 is a competent and fun 2D platformer, and when the jumping the shark moment for the Mario series is playing it too safe, you can say for certain that that's a damn good series. However, even though I'm not denouncing New Super Mario Bros. 2 as trash, it's the farthest thing from treasure. It's getting the very specific rating of Tarnished Bronze. It is something that still could be good, but the flaws completely overshadow it. At best, the game is decent, but for a Mario game, there's much to be desired no amount of coins could address. This game remains one of my least favorite games in the entire Mario series. We learned today that all that glitters is not gold, but maybe the sequel's better? <laughs> Ah, the Wii U, the console everybody seems to love to hate. But as the saying goes, they hate them because they ain't them. Kids nowadays will never know what Nintendo consoles were like that weren't held together by Elmer's glue and earwax and had controllers that didn't drift. I think it's apparent the Wii U holds a very special place in my heart. It also holds a special place in my TV and electrical outlet because I still play it to this day. But unfortunately, the Wii U wasn't exactly the revolution Nintendo was hoping for. It's by far their worst selling home console, with the Virtual Boy and Obscure Console revisions being the only ones that sold less. Some may think the Wii U sold poorly because it was a bad console. That's just not true. It was a combination of many different factors. The name itself was confusing. The initial reveal trailer in 2011 was an absolute fiasco. I was 11 years old at the time, ready to graduate elementary school, and I initially thought that it was a peripheral for the Wii. Years later I thought, maybe I was just naive. But no, many people thought that as well. 
likely because the term new controller was used 12 times in the reveal trailer and not once was the term new console used. But believe it or not, that wasn't the tipping point for the Wii U's failure. Don't believe me? Let's see how the same sort of advertisement could work for the Nintendo 64. Despite never saying the term new console, it's obvious the Nintendo 64 is a different console. That's because the games on it are far more advanced than anything on the Super Nintendo. The main reason why the Wii U failed, in my opinion, were the games revealed alongside it. Most games shown in the reveal trailer looked identical to Wii games. Wii Sports as a defining Wii game, and seeing it here, really made you believe the Wii U was an accessory for the Wii, and not the successor to the Wii. But if there's one guy who can showcase this is a new console better than anyone else, it's none other than Groose! Oh, and that obscure character Mario. Every Nintendo console has a definitive Mario game. Games like the Super Mario Bros. Trilogy, Super Mario World, the Super Mario Land games, especially Land 2, New Super Mario Bros., and any of the 3D Mario games showcase the capabilities of the consoles that they're on. They are system sellers. Super Mario Odyssey is a game that really enticed me to get a Switch. But could you imagine if a Nintendo console didn't have a major Mario game either launching or revealed alongside it? You might not even need to do that. Last episode, we took a look at New Super Mario Bros. 2. But nearly three months later, we got another New Super Mario Bros. game, being New Super Mario Bros. U. Both of these games are not seen in the brightest light. These games are often pinpointed as the games that led to the generic downfall of the Mario series from 2012 to 2016. I will admit that New Super Mario Bros. U looked far more interesting. I was a huge fan of the Mario series even then, and I could easily tell that the game had quite a few new features, but for a casual consumer, it looked identical to New Super Mario Bros. Wii. So the question is, is New Super Mario Bros. U the 5-star meal the series needed, or is it so generic, it may as well be called New Supermarket Pantry Marco. Remember how I said the games revealed alongside the Wii U in 2011 looked identical to Wii games? The Mario game shown was no exception. A tech demo called New Super Mario Bros. Me was used to showcase the off-TV play of the gamepad and HD graphical capabilities of the Wii U. One of these things is not like the other. Wait, wait just a minute. These look exactly the same. You tell me. If you saw a screenshot of New Super Mario Bros. Wii and Me side by side, would you initially be able to tell the difference? Very subtle differences are here, but only ones Mario series veterans would be able to notice. This is exactly why the Wii U was perceived to only be an add-on for the Wii. This tech demo later evolved into New Super Mario Bros. U. The reveal trailer for that game made it far more apparent that it was a new game, showcasing new features and backgrounds that had more detail and look different than the ones found in Wii. Unlike New Super Mario Bros. 2 that heavily marketed the coin gimmick, this game primarily marketed it was a sequel to Wii. Being a huge fan of New Super Mario Bros. Wii, I was very excited to get the game. In fact, I almost did get the game shortly after it launched. My birthday was coming up, and my dad was literally able to get the Wii U, despite it being a bit hard to find at launch. But because I wasn't behaving that day, my mom forced him to return it. I'm guessing getting Paper Mario Sticker Star was also part of the punishment. But whatever the case was, one day of misbehavior cost me an entire year without a Wii U. Eventually I decided to get my act together, and I got the Wii U for my birthday in 2013. It was a Mario and Luigi Bundle 2, which was perfect because I was excited to play Mario and Luigi U. But the question is, did New Super Mario Bros. U live up to the hype I had for it? New Super Mario Bros. 2 was so devoid of an interesting story that I had to make one up as a joke while covering the game. But here, I don't have to. They actually managed to do something different. Bowser and the Koopalings take over the Mushroom Kingdom and open seven Koopa Hotels. Oops, wrong game. Bowser and the Koopalings take over Peach's castle and throw Mario and friends to the other side of the Mushroom Kingdom. It's up to them to rescue Peach and regain Peach's castle. It still goes for the cliche, Bowser bad, 
Rescue Peach story, but at least it managed to do something slightly original. As I stated before, New Super Mario Bros. U doesn't have a defining gimmick like the coins in New Super Mario Bros. 2, but rather, it has new concepts and features throughout the game. You'll instantly notice one of them before you even play any levels. In most Mario games, the world map is separated, but here, it's connected. All the locations have names too, and there's a theme of food and beverages, though I'm not sure about Acorn Plains, because I've yet to meet someone who eats acorns. Occasionally you'll find alternate paths, letting you choose which levels you want to play first. The best thing about an interconnected world map is that it's more immersive and feels more organic, but honestly here, it's mainly just a gimmick. In Super Mario World, there were levels with secret exits, and you'd know this because the levels with secret exits were marked with a blinking light, but outside of a few visual cues, you'll never know directly which levels have secret exits, it wasn't an issue for me since I've been playing Mario games for years and on other ropes, but it's worth bringing up. Really, this is no different than the world map in New Super Mario Bros. Wii, with the only differences being the transitions between locations, and occasionally, you'll find power-ups on the map. An example of a truly intuitive world map is in Super Mario 3D World. There are many secrets in new locations, making the world map serve as more than just a way to organize levels. The world map isn't as interesting as it appears, but I'm hoping I'll go nuts for the game itself. The gameplay in New Super Mario Bros. U is identical to New Super Mario Bros. Wii, but this time, you can use button controls on the gamepad and Wii U Pro Controller. The motion controls in New Super Mario Bros. Wii were fun to use, but I don't always want to look like I'm having a seizure at family gatherings. The option to use a classic controller would have been very nice. If you play the game with button controls, all the motion controlled actions have been designated to the shoulder buttons. The only issue I have with them is that they're designated to the L and R buttons instead of ZL and ZR. I don't understand why Nintendo hates what players see as normal controls. And while we're at it, nobody likes playing NES games with the A and B buttons. Why not just allow us to use Y and B like in any modern 2D platformer? Using the L and R buttons for actions isn't a major problem but it's worth bringing up. Most of the game remains identical to Wii, but there are some new and returning concepts. The new Super Acorn power-up gives you the ability to glide, get a boost for extra height, increases the spin jump height, and lets you cling to walls. If this was a sugar glider suit, you'd also have the ability to bark, creating a shockwave defeating all enemies. While the raccoon suit is my favorite flight power-up, the squirrel suit is still very useful. All the power-ups from New Super Mario Bros. Wii return as well, the only catch is that the propeller mushrooms and penguin suits can only be found in toad houses in the special world. So the primary power-ups you'll use are the squirrel suit, along with the fire and ice flower. It's a nice mix to have, because all of them have different characteristics. And although the mega mushroom doesn't return, the mini mushroom is here, with the added ability of running up walls. It still is just a key to get star coins and find secret exits though. The mini mushroom is hardly a power-up, but more of an obstacle. The Squirrel Suit is the only new power-up, but there are new abilities you can use with the return of Baby Yoshis. There are three different Baby Yoshis, each with their own ability. The Magenta ones not only have no style or grace and have a funny face, but they can inflate themselves just like a balloon. And the yellow ones light up dark areas and can stun enemies. But unlike the other two, the glowing Baby Yoshis are only available in select levels. These abilities are directly from Super Mario Galaxy 2's Yoshi power-ups, only one of them has a new ability. Hey, can you blow bubbles with your spit? Like this, watch! <laughs> These bubbles can not only defeat enemies, but give you power-ups and create platforms. It was cool that Baby Yoshi's returned. Very nice throwback to Super Mario World. But to be honest, I don't like their addition. It's not for the reasons you'd expect either. They'd actually be cool to see in Mario Kart, as they have relevance to the series and weren't made up specifically for Mario Kart, like Baby Daisy and Rosalina. I also find them adorable, and it's a cute little touch that they sing to the music. My problem with them is that when you use them, it becomes a babysitting simulator. You'll have to constantly hold on to them. Some sections require the use of a fire or ice flower to get a star coin, and it's annoying having to alternate between the power-ups and Baby Yoshi. All their abilities could have just been used for power-ups. It would be more fun to have a bubble flower power-up, where you could just throw bubbles to create platforms and defeat enemies. These Baby Yoshis are also like Peter Pan and never grow up. I preferred their function in Super Mario World, where you'd feed them and watch them grow up to be powered-up Yoshis. Other than the Squirrel Suit and Baby Yoshis, the gameplay is mostly the same as New Super Mario Bros. Wii. 
All the levels are new, but they're designed very similar to Wii. The levels are more open, and the level design is good, but some star coins and hidden exits are in ridiculous places. This game went completely overboard with invisible blocks and walls, but most of the levels are well designed. You'll occasionally encounter new and seldomly seen enemies throughout the game. Goombas finally got a red Koopa equivalent, being the Goombrats, who won't walk off platforms. The Waddle Wings are the enemy equivalent of the Squirrel Suit, similar to the Super Koopas in Super Mario World. And not only does the elephant go THWOMP, but now we have circular thwomps that roll on the stage. And if you want a more smug bullet bill, Torpedo Ted is back from Super Mario World. While there are more new enemies than in New Super Mario Bros. 2, there aren't many. And when there is a new enemy, a level will make a big deal out of it, only for them to rarely be used again. It's even more unfortunate when it comes to the bosses. The only bosses are ones we've seen before. The only one that's kinda new is just a variation of an existing enemy. If you want to have the main bosses be Koopalings, fine. But why does nearly every tower boss have to be Boom Boom? This does not qualify as a boss battle. What's interesting is that despite all of this, there is a prominent new villain. Dare I say, he steals the spotlight. Nabbit makes his first appearance in the game, and you'll have to stop his Toad House heist in every world. These replace the Toad Rescue missions from New Super Mario Bros. Wii. If there's anything I didn't like in that game, those would be it. All you did was carry the worthless fungus to the goal, and got rewarded with a Toad House. Yippee. So they were pointless. But here, the Nabbit chases are fun, and if you do manage to catch him, you're awarded with the exclusive P Acorn. It functions like the squirrel suit, but you can have infinite boost. It's very similar to the P-Wing in Super Mario Bros. 3. And just like the P-Wing, it only lasts for one level, so it's best to use it when you need to. The biggest strength and weakness in New Super Mario Bros. U is how it plays nearly identically to New Super Mario Bros. Wii. The formula for that game was great, and this is a continuation of it. The problem is, almost none of the issues in that game were addressed here. All four players play identically, but you can only play as Mario in the main campaign. If you're a fan of the mean green ghost catching machine and the toads, well that's too bad. Even New Super Mario Bros. 2 had Luigi as an unlockable character. The only things you'll unlock here are the special world and the ability to save. Wow, thanks Nintendo, saving would make the game way too easy. The quick save makes perfect sense, it's my fault if I need to go to the bathroom, eat, or do anything else. But by far the most baffling design choice is how Yoshi is handled. In New Super Mario Bros. Wii, he was only available in select levels, and he couldn't be taken to other levels. You can bring the baby Yoshis to different levels here, but the regular Yoshis remain level exclusive. There's actually a good reason for this. This is a well-constructed and peer-reviewed answer as to why you can't bring the adult Yoshis to other levels in New Super Mario Bros. U. Oh wait, there is none! How does this make any sense? A sequel is made not just to succeed a successful game, but to correct flaws in a prior game. If there's something you didn't like in Wii, it's very likely going to be present here. But if there's one difference between the two games, it's a presentation. The Wii U is capable of HD, and this was the very first HD Mario game. But the question is, does the HD here stand for high definition, or highly disappointing? New Super Mario Bros. U has improved resolutions for all the characters and items, but they're literally just upscaled from Wii because the models are identical. The locations are more detailed, and some look noticeably different from Wii. Acorn Plains has rolling hills and oak trees. Soda Jungle has larger and more detailed trees. Good they didn't reuse textures from Nintendo 64 trees like a certain other game. And Frosted Glacier takes place at night, complete with Aurora Borealis. Other locations don't look too much different than Wii, but if all these locations have one thing in common, it's that they've been done before. All except for the final world are from every other new Super Mario Bros. game. There's only one level that everyone remembers, that being the Van Gogh-inspired Painted Swampland. This is what boggles my mind. The art design for this level is incredible. So why is most of the game so boring to look at? You also might want to pull a Van Gogh after listening to the soundtrack. Most of the music is recycled from Wii once again, but unlike New Super Mario Bros. 2, there are at least a few original songs here. The overworld has a new theme, and it's also applied to the athletic and snow theme. 
The final level and boss also have a really cool theme, and the map has new music as well. It's an improvement from New Super Mario Bros. 2, but not by much. That game literally had no original music, and it's very easy to pass the standard of none to some original music, and only a few of the new songs are excellent. So yes, HD here stands for highly disappointing. I'll always consider Mario Kart Arcade Grand Prix Deluxe to be the very first high-definition Mario game. Just like every new Super Mario Bros. game, this game has additional modes. It also got a major expansion being New Super Luigi U, but considering how Luigi U is essentially its own game, that's for another video. The co-op from New Super Mario Bros. Wii Returns. If you loved it there, you'll love it here. But if you didn't like it, you won't like it here either. I always found co-op to be the most fun with two players. It's far more manageable and less chaotic, but it's nice to have the ability to play with more than just two players. And surprisingly, you can actually play with up to five players now, but not in the way you'd expect. Rather than a third Toad, the fifth player will use a gamepad to place platforms in the level to help the other players out. This is the Little Brother's Little Brother mode. It's helpful if you want to reach star coins and avoid bottomless pits, but I'm certain most would want to actually play the game, and there should have been at least an option for true five-player co-op. There's also the coin battle mode returning from Wii, and your goal is to collect the most coins to win. It added the ability for players to have team battles, and a player can add coins to the levels using the gamepad. When it comes to multiplayer, the story mode is what I usually play, but unlike New Super Mario Bros. Wii, there are quite a few single player modes as well. Boost Rush has a collection of levels that speed up when you collect coins. It's similar to Time Trials in Mario Kart, as your goal is to complete the levels in the shortest amount of time. It's also similar to Time Trials, because I completely ignore this mode too. Most of the additional modes are either multiplayer exclusive, or not that interesting. But, there is one mode that's not just great, but one of the best modes in any Mario game. All the new Super Mario Bros. games are easy. They're not old school hard, not even 9-7 and Wii. But for those looking for a challenge, the challenge mode will provide just that. There are many different challenges, such as speed running, getting one-ups, and not touching the ground. These challenges can get very difficult, and they're an absolute blast to play. It's the best thing about New Super Mario Bros. U, and I hope to see it return in every succeeding 2D Mario game. It's worth bringing up that not only can you play as whatever character you want in the side modes, but also your me. So let me get this straight. Why can I use any character or me I want in every mode, but the main campaign? This game has so many baffling design choices. Even Patrick Starr would think, Why can't I play as Buckenberry in the single player campaign? Eventually, my rage of fury was heard, because in 2019, Nintendo released New Super Mario Bros. U Deluxe for the Switch. The Nintendo Switch truly is the first portable console, isn't it? Most of the popular Switch games are ports of Wii U games. I can't help but laugh that the exact same people who made fun of me for playing the Wii U in middle school are rushing out to play the same games I played years before them. The Wii U ports aren't a bad thing. Most are just highly overpriced. So let's see if New Super Mario Bros. U Deluxe truly lives up to the name. This game includes both New Super Mario Bros. U and New Super Luigi U, and I'm happy to say, out of all the issues I had with New Super Mario Bros. U, only two were addressed. You can finally play as any character you want in the main campaign, except for the Miis. This also applies to New Super Luigi U, but playing as Toad there feels kinda wrong. And finally, you can perform motion-controlled actions with the ZL and ZR buttons, but most of the issues I had with New Super Mario Bros. U are present here, and then some. Toadette replaces the fourth playable Toad, and has a few special abilities. She has great traction, can swim better, adds 100 seconds to the timer, and can transform into... Hold on. She can transform into... Let me prepare myself for this. She can transform into Peachette. First of all, why not just have Peach be playable? Sure you'd have to rescue someone else, but what's the point of making Peach only kinda playable, and really, Peachette is just a repurposed squirrel suit. Toadette makes an easy game even easier, but if you don't care about any semblance of challenge, you could just cheat your way through the levels and play as the Invincible Nabbit. He was playable in New Super Luigi U, but is now playable in Mario U as well. I remember a guy named Corollas telling me in 8th grade 
Mario is for babies, and considering how hard Nintendo pushed to make an easy game even easier, I can't say I'm too surprised where he's coming from. Not only that, any of the content that required the gamepad is missing here. I wasn't a huge fan of it, but since when is removing content considered deluxe? But the worst things about New Super Mario Bros. U Deluxe are in regards to multiplayer and the controls. If you're playing with four players, one player will either have to play as Toadette or Nabbit, so they'll always have an edge. Blue Toad is only a costume for Toad and is not a separate character. It's a really stupid decision, but this game somehow managed to make me lose even more brain cells with the controls. The spin jump is designated by default to the B button. Tapping it twice activates a spin jump, but oftentimes you'll spin jump on accident because of this. But that's not a problem, I'll just turn it off in the settings. Wait, it's not even in the settings. Get this, you have to manually click the left stick and hold the L and R buttons for 3 seconds on the title screen, and then press A to deactivate the spin jump. Every time you boot up the game, if you ever feel useless, always remember that there is a guy in this world who was so proud of designating the spin jump to the B button that he only allowed players to turn it off by inputting a cheat code. So unless you really, 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 really love Buck and Barry and Ala Gold and have a bizarre fascination with Peachette, this game is actually worse than the original. So unless you didn't own a Wii U or want to play New Super Mario Bros. U on the porcelain throne outside of your own home, stay far away from this game. There is nothing deluxe about it. So far we've established that New Super Mario Bros. U is fun and has great level design, and the challenge mode is excellent, but the game does suffer from being extremely derivative of New Super Mario Bros. Wii, the presentation is unimpressive, and a lot of the new ideas it introduces either fall flat or are just uninteresting. So what's the verdict? Out of all the games that I've covered, coming up with a verdict for New Super Mario Bros. U proved to be the most difficult. I was so confused about my stance on the game, that I had a conversation with TND about New Super Mario Bros. U for well over an hour, and I've come to the conclusion that the answer isn't as straightforward as you'd think. New Super Mario Bros. U is a good game, I've gotten many hours out of it, and had fond memories playing it, and it's still fun to play to this day. Objectively, it's also one of the best 2D Mario games out there, and unlike New Super Mario Bros. 2, there are at least some new mechanics and features that resort to being more than just a gimmick, but here's a problem, New Super Mario Bros. U is just New Super Mario Bros. Wii all over again. Some may argue New Super Mario Bros. Wii is just DS again, but in defense of Wii, that game added major new features and brought back long-awaited returning concepts. The co-op was a huge new addition. If you didn't like it, then yeah, your experience will be very similar to the first game. It also had excellent new power-ups, each with different unique abilities. And although the Koopalings now have the reputation of being the pinnacle of lazy bosses and hogging Mario Kart roster spots, seeing them in 3D for the first time was very cool. It was nice seeing them return. There were also many new enemies and mechanics introduced. New Super Mario Bros. U is pretty much just an extension of Wii. The levels are great and the power-ups are too, but considering how similar it is and how it addressed next to no issues from that game, it's a very forgettable and underwhelming experience. Think of it this way. Everybody and their mother wants Mario Kart 9 except for J-Plays. We've been waiting a long time for it, but instead of doing something revolutionary and memorable, Nintendo decides to recycle Mario Kart 8. The tracks are new, but often have the same music and themes as the tracks in 8, and almost none of the issues from Mario Kart 8 are addressed. It still would be a good game at the very least, but the lost potential sours the experience and makes it forgettable. New Super Mario Bros. U has also aged as well as Donatella Versace, not because cultural norms have changed, or because of technical limitations. Nearly every 2D platformer since then has completely blown it out of the water. Games like Rayman Legends and Origins, Donkey Kong Country Returns and Tropical Freeze, and even lower key games like Yoshi's Crafted World are superior in every aspect. The levels feel organic, archaic elements like the timer are gone, and they have excellent mechanics and presentations that prove 2D platformers aren't a relic of the past. Mario used to be the shining example of what 2D platformers should be, and when the series that set the standard for 2D platformers now has some of the weakest and most forgettable platformers out there, that's a major problem, and it's really sad. New Super Mario Bros. U isn't bad, it's still a good game, 
but it's extremely repetitive and forgettable. If you own a Switch and want a 2D Mario game, get Super Mario Maker 2 instead. It's far more creative and interesting, and it even has a story mode with over 100 levels made by Nintendo. But as it stands, New Super Mario Bros. U gets the specific ranking of Stolen Treasure. New Super Mario Bros. U is indeed a good game, but it leeches off entirely from New Super Mario Bros. Wii. And the more I think about it, the more I realize that I actually have more resentment towards this game than New Super Mario Bros. 2. The reason because of this is that there's a lot of lost potential that's noticeable in the game. With New Super Mario Bros. 2, that game is completely unoriginal and has a coin gimmick that resorts to nothing. So really, it was kind of dead on arrival, but this game had some really cool concepts that were never lived up to their full potential. We have a really cool level inspired by Starry Night, but it's only one level. The rest of the worlds are basic Mario worlds we've seen before, and they didn't even attempt to address any issues from New Super Mario Bros. Wii. It's quite obvious the game is trying to be reminiscent of Super Mario World, but why can't you take Yoshi out of levels? Why can't you know directly which levels have secret exits? This could have been one of the best and most memorable 2D Mario games out there, but unfortunately, it just remains stagnant and a forgettable experience. And to answer the question from before, it really wasn't that huge of a punishment not getting a Wii U for a year. Super Mario 3D World launched a year after the Wii U, and it's superior to New Super Mario Bros. U in every way. Although playing Paper Mario Sticker Star, that was indeed a punishment. <laughs> Something's coming up the plumbing for the wheel. He's in a bind. Giant turtles out to get him. Yeah. Crabs are right behind. Fighter flies. Uh. Super shines. They're all coming out the pipes. Mario, where are you? What's this? Dear Luigi, I've taken a trip to Mario Land because Wario's been causing havoc once again. I have six golden coins to find, and I'm unsure when I'll return. Your brother, Mario. Looks like I have to rescue the Mushroom Kingdom whether I like it or not! When I was in elementary school, we were taught about recycling and going green. I made an effort to go green, but I may have misunderstood what going green actually meant. I got New Super Mario Bros. in May of 2010. I absolutely loved the game. It was one of the most popular games at my school. I was new to the Mario series, and a friend told me to hold L and R while starting up New Super Mario Bros. And lo and behold, I was introduced to the lean, green, ghost catching machine. Every time there's an opportunity to play as Luigi, I immediately jumped it. He somehow manages to make Mario games even better. Originally, he was only a palette swap of Mario, but as the series evolved, Luigi gained his signature look and got an identity of his own. Luigi is a modest guy and is always willing to help his brother out, even if it's not in his best interest. He may be a bit cowardly and insecure, but the reality is, he's actually the superior brother. Luigi is easily one of the most popular and well-liked Mario characters, and because of this, he got his own series being Luigi's Mansion. I always consider Luigi's Mansion to be the first game to have Luigi as a protagonist, but being a plumber, Luigi had to go through a lot of trash before finding treasure. The first game to have Luigi as a protagonist is none other than Luigi's Hammer Toss. This was an LCD game, very similar to the Game & Watch, you play as Luigi juggling hammers, making sure they don't fall to the ground. Very similar to Ball. Oddly, when you start the game, you'll hear the beginning of La Cucaracha. You think that's bad? Remember the time I sang La Cucaracha while Luigi was juggling hammers? Am I missing something here? There are two subjects you don't bring up to Mario fans. March 31st, and Mario is missing. During the early to mid 90s, a series of educational Mario games were released. Mario's Missing is often considered to be one of the worst Mario games. It's not because it's educational either. I grew up playing the Leapster, and the games were fun while also being educational. I also love geography, 
and seeing real world locations in Mario games is always very cool. But all Mario is missing is, is a collection of tests disguised as a game, but the worst thing about the game is the sneaky marketing surrounding it. Mario is missing looks just like Super Mario World, and the title doesn't imply in any way that it's educational. Mario teaches typing, well that's obviously educational, but since there was none to limited internet when the game released, I'm sure many were tricked into buying the game, because the idea of a Luigi game is an intriguing and great concept, considering when Mario is missing released, I'm sure many pictured it to be a 2D platformer starring Luigi, and the good news is that nearly two decades later, players would finally get the Mario's Missing that they dreamed for. The best anniversary celebration Nintendo has ever done is easily the Year of Luigi. They went all out celebrating for the Great Green One, with many Luigi modes and Easter eggs in games, and even quite a few games starring Luigi as the protagonist. Of course, there was Luigi's Mansion Dark Moon, but we also got Dr. Luigi, Luigi Brothers, and most notably, New Super Luigi U. New Super Luigi U is an interesting case. It was originally a paid DLC expansion for New Super Mario Bros. U, but it also got a standalone physical release. Most consider it to be its own game. Revisiting New Super Mario Bros. U proved to be challenging. I felt many different emotions replaying the game, and most of them weren't good. I must admit, I'm a little intimidated revisiting New Super Luigi U. New Super Mario Bros. U turned out to be way less enjoyable than I remembered it. So the question is, is New Super Luigi U the Mario's missing that should have been, or should this game end up missing? In the early 2010s, Nintendo started experimenting with DLC. New Super Mario Bros. 2 was one of the first Nintendo games, and the very first Mario game, to get DLC with the additional Coin Rush packs. Initially, New Super Mario Bros. U was going to do something similar. Ideas of additional Boost Rush packs were discussed, but once it was found out the developers forgot Boost Rush existed, they decided to do something different. An expansion with more challenging levels was what they went with. Originally, it was designed with Mario in mind, but Luigi became the focus when the year Luigi was brought up at a meeting. New Super Luigi U initially released as a DLC expansion for New Super Mario Bros. U in June of 2013, for 20 USD. It also saw a standalone physical release in August of 2013 for 30 USD. The physical copy of the game is easily the coolest looking Wii U game. It came in a nice green case, letting you know that it's something truly special. This is something every Luigi fan should have. Eventually though, the game came bundled with New Super Mario Bros. U, starting with the Mario & Luigi Wii U bundle, which is the one I got. It was also included in New Super Mario Bros. U Deluxe, on the Nintendo Switch. This game defined the year Luigi, and let's see if it's still something to celebrate about. The story is identical to New Super Mario Bros. U. Bowser and the Koopalings take over Peach's castle, and you'll have to rescue her and regain the castle. But there is a difference. Mario is nowhere to be found. He is referenced with his hat being on the table, but I'm guessing he either went to Sarasaland or Mario Land. Or he forgot to use a 1-Up Mushroom. This is the first game where Mario doesn't appear, but Luigi is present. Other than that, the story remains the same. Some suggested that Daisy should have replaced Peach, but I disagree. You only had to rescue Daisy once in Super Mario Land. Since then, her priorities are now kart racing, playing sports, partying, and spending time with Luigi. All Peach is is a tool who doesn't care about Mario in the slightest. Personally, I think the story would be even better if Luigi was just bored and decided he'd fight with Bowser because he had nothing better to do that day. But as with any 2D Mario or Luigi game, the story doesn't matter. What matters most is the gameplay. The world map is the same one used in New Super Mario Bros. U. All the locations are identical, and if a level had a secret exit in Mario U, the Luigi U equivalent will as well. I wouldn't mind if the levels remained in the same spots, but I do think the world map would have benefited from different theming. It wouldn't have to be a major overhaul, but something like the change from Spring to Autumn in Super Mario World would have been very nice. But despite the world map being identical, the levels themselves are completely new. At first glance, the game looks identical to New Super Mario Bros. U, but looks can be deceiving. Luigi has been playable in every New Super Mario Bros. game, and his abilities were identical to Mario. But here, Luigi gains back his signature abilities, being his high jump and poor traction. Luigi's abilities originated in Super Mario Bros. The Lost Levels, 
in that game, it was near impossible to control Luigi well. It's understandable he needed to have poor traction, so he's not overpowered, but it's so bad it's not even worth playing as him. But here, the controls are much better. His traction is far more manageable. The higher jump also makes the squirrel suit and the despicable mini mushroom much more useful, but the physics work better here because the levels take account for them. You may think the levels are just an extension of New Super Mario Bros. U, but New Super Luigi U was able to take one of the most trivial aspects in Mario games and turn it into the defining mechanic. When playing a Mario game, you likely forget two things exist, the timer and the score. These archaic concepts have somehow remained in Mario games. Games in the early 80s were all about getting a high score, and a timer was necessary to have, that way people wouldn't hog the machine. But with the NES, games became more advanced, focusing more on the adventure and story, instead of a high score. I honestly cannot think of a modern 2D platformer that I played that has a timer, other than the Mario games. It's unnecessary because under normal circumstances, you'll complete a level with plenty of time left. So in 2D Mario games, it's pointless, but this isn't a Mario game. It's Luigi time, as long as it's within 100 seconds. This drastically changes the feeling of the game. The limited time is only one of the aspects that sets Luigi U apart from Mario games. The biggest strength in New Super Luigi U is the level design. The levels are short, but there is rarely ever idle time, and there's always something going on. There are a great amount of enemies and obstacles. You'll have to stay alert at all times. Accounting for the time limit, the levels are designed to be shorter, but even though the levels are short, they manage to be memorable. The first stage in Lair Cake Desert starts off with the skeleton of an ox. I'm wondering if that's referencing Bowser's origin, or maybe it's just a coincidence. You'll have to run through the stage avoiding the spikes thrown by the character that deserved to be in Smash more than anyone else. Many of my favorite levels in the game are in the beach world, sparkling waters. The first level has you condemn a resort filled with huckets. Considering Luigi's first game, he's a natural at this. And the castle stage doesn't go for the cliche lava theme, but it's an outdoor and underwater castle. It also features the strongest Mario enemy ever, King Bell. All the stages in New Super Luigi U are memorable. New Super Mario Bros. U was essentially a rehash of New Super Mario Bros. Wii. But New Super Luigi U, on the other hand, has its own identity and feels distinct. What's interesting is that despite the creativity, it doesn't introduce any new power-ups, and the only new enemy is a larger Eep Cheap. But even though Luigi U doesn't introduce new power-ups, the Propeller Mushroom and Penguin Suit are given a lot more use. Since they only appeared in the Special World Toad Houses in Mario U, they were pretty much designated to the final levels or Star Coin Cleanup. But here, you'll often find the Propeller Mushroom in enemy courses, and the Penguin Suit has levels designed with it in mind. The main problem with New Super Mario Bros. U is that even though it has a few new ideas, they're either never lived up to the full potential, or aren't that interesting. But in New Super Luigi U, the concepts of shorter and more challenging levels is lived up to the full potential. The time adds pressure, but the levels themselves are more challenging. The obstacle and enemy placements are natural, and if you lose, well that's on you. For those who like exploration, the star coins are still present, but you'll have to manage your time searching for them. Their function is identical to how it is in New Super Mario Bros. Wii and U, where they'll unlock levels in the special world. Occasionally, you will find star coins hidden in cryptic places, but overall, they're placed in places that make sense. So far we've established that New Super Luigi U may have a lot in common with its older brother, but it manages to make the most out of its new concepts with excellently designed and more challenging levels that are memorable. But if there's one thing Mario and Luigi U have in common, it's the presentation. So you think. The general presentation is identical to New Super Mario Bros. U. The world themes and soundtrack are exactly the same, but believe it or not, it manages to be significantly better. There is a far greater attention to detail in New Super Luigi U. As I stated before, Lair Cake Desert has the Ox Skeleton, but in Acorn Plains, the ground is different with a green floral design. Rainbows are also incorporated into some levels, but where the presentation shines the most is with the hidden Luigis found in every level. They don't affect the gameplay, but it's always cool finding them. Some are 8-bit sprites, but others are cleverly hidden in levels. Some of my favorites are the Topiary Luigi in Acorn Plains, the Luigi Ice Sculpture, and a giant Luigi sprite 
from Super Mario Advance 2. I won't spoil them, considering that that's part of the fun, but even though the presentation is mostly the same as Mario U, it manages to be far more creative, and the improvements are nice, even if they're subtle. I would've liked the game to have unique themes and a new soundtrack, but considering it's an expansion of New Super Mario Bros. U, it was fair to expect the games to be similar in that regard. When it comes to the content, New Super Luigi U falls into a gray area. In most circumstances, New Super Luigi U is bundled with New Super Mario Bros. U because it was designed as DLC, but if you manage to find the standalone physical version on the Wii U, here's what to expect. What you see is what you get. There are no additional modes, meaning no coin battle, no boost rush, and no challenge mode. But the game does have co-op multiplayer, just like most new Super Mario Bros. games. Mario is not playable, but why would you want to play as Mario when Buck and Berry and a la Gold are playable? Luigi's physics are also applied to them. I will admit, it's very bizarre seeing them jump like Luigi, but it does make sense so other players wouldn't have an edge. But if a player happens to be suckish at the game, they can have an edge. Rather than a third Toad, Nabbit makes his playable debut, and he has different abilities too. He has the same physics as Luigi, but has the ability not to get damaged by enemies. This also means he cannot power up, ride Yoshi, or throw items. Oddly enough, he still appears as a villain because the Nabbit chases are still present. You can also play as him in single player by holding ZL before starting a level. The reason why Nabbit is playable and is invincible is likely due to time constraints. Designing powered up forms for him and creating new animations would have slowed down development time. As for how I feel about his inclusion, I'm a bit mixed. I love Nabbit, and being able to play as him is cool, but when it comes to the invincibility, I don't like it. I will always be honest in my reviews, and I need to address my thoughts on easy modes and games. Most games nowadays are far too easy, mainly due to the game design itself. These easy modes are only part of the problem. I am not a fan of when things such as Super Guides, the White Tanuki Suit, or any invincibility mode are used to complete a game. I will admit, it's fun to use cheat codes to mess around in a game I already beat. But if you play as Nabbit to beat the game, you're cheating yourself more than anyone else. Trial and error creates skill in players, and it's what gaming is all about. In a new Super Luigi U or any Mario game, the levels are the experience. These are usually optional modes, but unfortunately, one player will always have to play as Nabbit if there are four players. The option for a third Toad would have been very nice. It's also a bit jarring that the issue of having Nabbit playable and also the villain wasn't addressed. Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze had Funky Kong as a shop owner, but if you play as him, the shop is owned by a new character Tox the Parrot. Even something as basic as a silly and new villain called Wabbit to replace Nabbit in the chases would have been fine. It's not a big deal, but it's worth bringing up. And if you're wondering if the game saw any changes in New Super Mario Bros. U Deluxe, there are a few, but most don't help the game. You can play as any character you want in the main campaign, but if you're playing with four players, not just one, but two players will have an edge. This is because they'll have to play as Toadette and Nabbit, so unless you want the extra challenge mode adrift, just stick to the Wii U one. The game may not have additional modes, but considering the standalone release was only 30 USD, it wasn't a huge issue. The game is complete and is highly replayable. It doesn't need to rely on quote-unquote free content updates like so many of the games on the best game console of all time, the Switch, do. I've mostly praised New Super Luigi U, but there are a few criticisms I have. The game is more challenging, but the bosses are still too easy. The bosses are identical to the ones found in Mario U, and defeating them is the same. Even something as basic as requiring 5 hits to defeat them would have been appreciated. And while I don't think Daisy needed to be rescued, seeing King Boo instead of Bowser would have been cool alongside his minions. Most issues I had with New Super Mario Bros. U would also technically apply here, but they don't impact the experience for me as much considering the context of how the game was released. New Super Luigi U is an expansion of Mario U, but New Super Mario Bros. U was supposed to be the brand new Mario game launched to showcase the Wii U, so it's a bit of an apples and oranges situation. Wait, oranges? Okay, moving <laughs> on to the final verdict. So far we've established that New Super Luigi U may look similar to Mario U, but the experience is radically different. 
the presentation is enhanced with more vibrant colors, and the hidden Luigi's are so much fun to find, and the game itself is a blast to play and is highly replayable. So what's the verdict? No need for an artsy ranking this time. New Super Luigi U is without a doubt, no questions asked, an absolute treasure. I'd go as far to say, it's emerald encrusted treasure. Even though the year Luigi concluded, every time I play this game, it feels like a celebration of the year of Luigi once again. This is absolutely what Mario is missing should have been. Not only that, but the game is actually better than New Super Mario Bros. U. The game is much faster paced, and it has its own identity. I'd love to see another Luigi-centered platformer in the future, and considering next year marks a decade since the year of Luigi, I'm hoping for a sequel. <laughs> Nintendo's attempt to enter the mobile gaming market has been rocky to say the least. Nintendo's biggest strength is how they're not afraid to take risks and innovate. The Famicom controller was the first to use a D-pad. It was radically different from the common joystick controllers at the time, but it set the standard for all modern game controllers. The Wii also took the world by storm with the motion controls. And even though the Switch is held together by earwax and Elmer's glue, the idea of a console you can take with you is nothing short of brilliant. Nintendo's biggest strength, however, is also their biggest weakness. The world simply wasn't ready to sear out their retinas by playing golf in the depths of hell, or having a Star Fox game play like a game of Bop It. To be fair, the Virtual Boy and Wii U were inventions of Nintendo. The Virtual Boy was far too ahead of its time, and the Wii U suffered mostly due to poor marketing. Where I think they fail the most is when they try to reinvent established concepts. Of course there's an abomination known as Nintendo Switch Online, you can't message your friends or voice chat natively, but playing a broken version of Paper Mario is A-OK -okay because you use a gift card you could've used for literally anything else to get it. This also applies to their mobile market strategy. The standard has been making games free to play, but including microtransactions or ads for monetization. But Nintendo tried something different with Super Mario Run. A few levels would be playable in a free demo, but you'd have to pay $10 for the full game. Having a one-time payment is great because it's fair, and it doesn't lead into the slippery slope of gambling, but many didn't see it that way. Some say this is the primary factor why Super Mario Run underperformed, but just because something was a financial disappointment for Nintendo doesn't make it bad. I love the Wii U and continue to play it to this day, and even if something sells well, that's not an indicator of it being good quality. You know what sold well in the 80s? Crack! Being a huge fan of Mario, I certainly was interested. I got Super Mario Run, and you can thank my brother for getting me a Play Store card for Christmas in 2016. Let's see how Mario's first mobile adventure is held up. Our story begins not only with Mario trying to defeat microtransactions and loot boxes, but Bowser Bad, Rescue Peach. It's a mobile game so I'm not too upset with the cliche story, and at least Bowser gets his clown car back. Pretty cool stuff there. But just like with any 2D Mario game, the story isn't going to make or break the game. The gameplay is the most important factor. Mobile games face the limitation of not having buttons. Technically, you could have a virtual D-pad and buttons, but it never feels right. Super Mario Run worked around this by being an auto-runner. You move automatically and perform actions by tapping the screen. Nintendo heavily promoted Super Mario Run as a game you could play with one hand. This means that you can finally enjoy Extra Flame and Hot Cheetos and play Mario at the very same time. It also means the next day you can play Mario Run and have the run simultaneously. But regardless of how you play it, the game controls quite well. Despite the game being an auto runner instead of a traditional 2D platformer, the core mechanics are what you'd expect in a Mario game. You jump, Goombas can still be smushed, and the main objective is to reach the goal. But surprisingly, many new mechanics are introduced. There are blocks within the levels that allow for different actions, such as doing a backflip, standing in place, or even doing a long jump. They are here primarily to work around the limitations and give the player a sense of more control. This was also the very first Mario game to ditch lives. The near-extinct 1-Up Mushrooms are replaced with Bubbles. If you get defeated, you'll start where you left off, but you can also use them to backtrack in a level. Once you run out of Bubbles, you'll have to start the level over. This adds an element of strategy to the game. You'll have to decide if it's a better idea to use a bubble to get something you missed, or if it should be saved just in case something happens. Unlike most Mario games, Super Mario Run doesn't have any power-ups outside the Super Mushroom and the Starman, but Super Mario Run includes one of my most wanted features in any Mario game. 
Not only can you play as Mario, but there are many other characters as well, each with their own abilities. Luigi and Toad have their signature abilities from Super Mario 3D World, where Luigi can jump higher, and Toad has a faster speed. But not only do you have the mainstays, but there are many new playable characters as well. Yoshi can flutter jump, and he can walk on spikes. Toadette is kinda useless, but does have a purpose in one of the secondary modes. But perhaps the coolest addition is none other than Purple Yoshi. Wow, it's Barney! To be fair, I love Purple Yoshi, but most would consider the next character to be the most interesting addition. Daisy makes her playable debut in a 2D Mario game, and can double jump. There's a lot of love for Daisy, and it's great seeing her used in the mainline games. But unfortunately, Wario and Waluigi are seemingly banned from mainline Mario games. Oh, I'm never going to be in Smash or a Mario game, but see this Yoshi costume? Maybe I can join the game if I'm Purple Yoshi. Wah! I guess you'll just have to pretend that Purple Yoshi and Yellow Yoshi are Wario and Waluigi in disguise. But having multiple playable characters is great, and is something that should be in every Mario game. Come to think of it, the game has a lot in common with Super Mario Bros. 2. This goes beyond multiple playable characters and the lack of power-ups. Ninjis return, and are given a slightly new design. I always thought the buttons were fangs, but they're clearly buttons now. Another obscure enemy returns being fish and booze. There's even a poisonous variety of the lava bubble. Most enemies are basic, but it's cool seeing obscure enemies as well. The theming for the levels is also very basic. All the Mario themes such as planes, deserts, and airships, we've seen them before. They're standard in the series. A lack of interesting locations has been a major problem with 2D Mario games, but considering that this is a mobile game, I'm a bit more lenient. It's fair for the game to be a little more vanilla, considering it's a very casual game. Where I won't be lenient is with the level design. Doesn't matter if the game is on a console, a phone, or in a hotel, the level design is by far the most important aspect in a Mario game. Just like New Super Mario Bros. 2, the levels are short, but for those wanting more depth, each level has five hidden coins. They're very similar to the star coins, but they managed to take the concept of star coins and make it even better. The first coins you'll need to find are the pink coins. But once you get all the pink coins, they're replaced by the purple coins which are trickier to find. And if you get all the purple prizes in a level, they'll be replaced with the rare black coins. These are the most difficult to find, with most being in hard to reach areas. I would love to see the hidden coins incorporated into a 2D Mario game. It adds challenge and makes levels even more replayable, considering that they're increasing difficulty to obtain. The game actually manages to have a balanced difficulty, where it's not lost levels difficult, but not New Super Mario Bros. 2 easy either. When it comes to the general level design, the levels are well designed, but I did notice something while playing them. Miyamoto stated that Super Mario Maker initially started off as a tool for Nintendo to make Mario levels, and here, it is definitely apparent that's how the levels were made. The levels do not feel organic at all. You can easily tell they were made on a grid. That's not to say the levels are poorly designed, but it's very noticeable, especially if you played Super Mario Maker before. So far we have established that Super Mario Run does a great job handling mobile game limitations, and it managed to introduce great concepts that are beyond just a gimmick. The fact that a mobile Mario game introduced concepts far more innovative than New Super Mario Bros. U showcases how underwhelming that game was. But if the two games have anything in common, it's a presentation. The general presentation looks very similar to New Super Mario Bros. U. The locations are identical. The characters and items look very similar, but Super Mario Run manages to look significantly better. This is because the colors are more saturated, and the characters actually have personality. Rather than just running to the right, they do parkour as well. It really gives the characters more personality, and it's a lot of fun to look at. Some would say the new Super Mario Bros. U soundtrack is bop bop bad, but in Super Mario Run, it looks like whoever sings the boss had a bad case of laryngitis. The music is remixed from Mario U, but the soundtrack is actually great. It's much higher energy than the music in Mario U, but where the soundtrack shines the most is with the Remix 10 theme. It takes music from classic Mario games, and even has Daisy sing a few lyrics. I'm glad Luigi was the Mario brother who got a great and talented girlfriend. The only criticisms that I have regarding the presentation are that the game cannot be played in landscape mode, and I would've liked to see more variety when it came to the music. But the good news is that you can listen to whatever music you want. The characters even get headphones while you play your own music. Whether you want the game to be Zombie Nation Mario 400 or Daruk Sandstorm, the world is your toaster. 
Pretty ironic that this game launched on the masterpiece of crap known as the iPhone 7, which notoriously removed the headphone jack. Super Mario Run has quite a few additional modes. Toad Rally is where you race other players, but it's their ghost like in Mario Kart's time trials. By performing stylish jumps and collecting coins, you'll have more toads cheering you on. Some characters can actually attract more toads, such as Toadette. If you win, you get to keep all the toads, but if you lose, you actually will lose toads. Considering how many Mario games have made the effort to be as easy as possible, I'm quite surprised. But it's nice that there's a penalty for losing, so players can become more skilled. Collecting toads also unlocks more items to be purchased with coins. Super Mario Run actually managed to give the coins more of a purpose than the game that's all about the coins, New Super Mario Bros. 2. Wow. You can get items to customize the Mushroom Kingdom, as well as get new characters. Some items are only cosmetic, but you can actually earn more Toad Rally tickets with the question blocks. The hidden coins also unlock levels you can place in the Mushroom Kingdom. The final mode is Remix 10. It combines sections from 10 different levels, and by collecting the rainbow coins, you can earn new items, and if you make it to Area 30, you'll unlock Daisy. This mode is a blast to play, and is perfect to play on the go. Super Mario Run has quite a bit of content, but there is a major issue. The unlocking criteria for many items and characters are unbelievably absurd. To get Red Yoshi, you'll need to recruit 9,999 toads, 1,000 yellow toads, and have 50,000 coins. Look, I love Mario games, but I also love life. I don't want to waste countless hours trying to unlock Red Yoshi. If it were Waluigi, maybe that would be a different story. I am all for having challenging criterias to unlock characters. That's part of what made Mario Kart Wii so fun. But never did I find these challenging. They're just monotonous. Even unlocking Daisy is tedious. It's clear the game has ridiculous unlocking requirements to artificially lengthen the game. Another bizarre thing is that the game only has a one-time fee, but you'll still need to use tickets to play Toad Rally and Remix 10. I'm not sure if the game was designed to be a free-to-play game, and then quickly changed into a one-time payment game. But it doesn't make any sense. Not including any of the filler content, Super Mario Run still has a good amount of content and is replayable. But for Red Yoshi fans, expect to be in a retirement home before you unlock him. So far we've established that Super Mario Run is a competent mobile adaptation of Super Mario Bros. It has excellent new and returning ideas, has a stellar presentation, and has a good amount of content but it does fall flat by having ridiculous unlocking criterias and an unnecessary ticket system. So what's the verdict? You may initially think Super Mario Run is without a doubt a treasure, considering how much I've praised it, but the game has a significant issue that could be a deal breaker. It's not as awful as not being able to upload levels in Super Mario Maker 3DS, but it's up there. Super Mario Run requires players to have a constant internet connection to play the game. This is something present in all of Nintendo's mobile games. The game doesn't use a lot of data, but the entire concept of a mobile game is to play a game anywhere to pass some time. It's likely you'd play Super Mario Run on a plane or on a subway. There's either limited to no internet connection. Same would also apply to rural areas. And don't forget, these are Nintendo servers, so expect a few errors occasionally. Having the always online requirement entirely defeats the purpose of a mobile game. What on planet Earth would it take Nintendo to realize that trying to stop piracy by being anti-consumer never, ever works? They lost many second-party developers because they didn't like that the Nintendo 64 used cartridges. It also made games more expensive. Using mini DVDs for the GameCube didn't help either. These stupid decisions caused more financial loss than piracy ever could. Thank you, Nintendo, for going full force to stop emulation of games that you don't even sell anymore and ruining your mobile games for the false hope of security. In the meantime, I'll play all of these totally legit Mario games. But perhaps the scariest thing about it is that once Nintendo shuts down the servers for Super Mario Run, Super Mario Run will cease to exist. Game preservation is important. It's very hard to find a working Famicom disk system, but you can play Super Mario Bros. The Lost Levels in many different ways thanks to game preservation. But since Super Mario Run requires a server, it can't be preserved unless fans find a workaround. But if not, it'll end up just like Dr. Mario World. If it's truly mainline, that's a huge problem for someone wanting to experience the entire series. But what about the present day? It's February 2022, and Super Mario Run is still playable and available to purchase. Is it worth $10? 
I would say yes. For mobile gamers, a flat fee of $10 was seemingly expensive. I do think that the game is slightly overpriced and should have probably been $5 or $7, but the main reason why Super Mario Run failed is because the demo was too short and failed to impress players. There wasn't enough free content to get players reeled in, but the full experience is a fun 2D Mario game that has more to offer than you'd initially expect. And honestly, the fair one-time payment is a great thing, because Mario Kart Tour has the most disgusting microtransactions and greed I've ever seen in my life. I also did a video about Mario Kart Tour that I'll link at the end. Just remember you'll need a constant internet connection to play the game. Super Mario Run gets the ranking of Silver Treasure. It's not the best Mario game out there, but you will have a good time with it if you're a fan of the series. <laughs> I recently covered Kirby's Star Allies. During the retrospective, I brought up how Kirby's Return to Dream Land created a formula that succeeding games used. Does that ring a super bell? Because New Super Mario Bros. set the formula for the succeeding 2D Mario games. The games that are always brought up showcasing how bland and archaic 2D Mario has become are Donkey Kong Country Returns and Tropical Freeze. These are phenomenal games, and Mario certainly could learn a lot from the King of Kong. But honestly, Kirby is an even better and more relatable example when it comes to discussing the issues with the new Super Mario Bros. series. Kirby's Return to Dream Land, Kirby Triple Deluxe, and Kirby Planet Robobot use a very similar formula, but all of them provided unique experiences. Triple Deluxe introduced the mechanic of jumping between the foreground and the background. Planet Robobot expanded on it greatly, with more interesting locations going all out with the tech theme, along with the Robobot mechanic. The point is, the issue isn't solely reusing a formula. Let's take a look at why New Super Mario Bros. U fell flat. The locations are the same as Wii. The levels are different, but the overall pacing and design is very similar to Wii. A sequel to New Super Mario Bros. Wii was something I really wanted to see. But what we got is New Super Mario Bros. Wii hashed. But there is some hope, because fans do what Nintendo don't. A group of passionate Mario fans developed an entirely new sequel to New Super Mario Bros. Wii, appropriately titled Newer Super Mario Bros. Wii. It's a modification to the original game that can be played on a homebrewed Wii. You'll need a copy of New Super Mario Bros. Wii to play it as well. The game has been acclaimed by many, and many say it's one of the best 2D Mario games out there. So the question is, were fans able to create the ultimate 2D Mario game? Grab your penguin suit as we dive into this retrospective. The story takes place right after the events of Wii. Hot air balloons, disgruntled Luigi, it has it all. It does go for the tired cliche, Bowser bad, rescue Peach story, but as I always say, story isn't the most important factor in a 2D Mario game. The first thing you'll notice playing the game is a completely revamped world map. The locations are connected just like they were in Super Mario World and New Super Mario Bros. U. But unlike Mario U where the map is just a fancy way to connect levels, the map is natural here. You'll uncover many different paths which can lead to new levels and secret areas. You'll also know which levels have secret exits because they're marked with a purple dot. This was an issue in Mario U because the levels with secret exits were not even marked and the map often didn't even have visual cues, so it's great to have it here. You'll also find switch towers like in Super Mario World. By hitting one, you can uncover new areas and levels. This is what Mario U should have done, but this isn't an episode of Dora the Explorer, so let's move on to the gameplay before Demich musical number happens. Since this is a modification of Wii, the core gameplay is identical. The controls are the same, but you also have the option to use the Wii Classic controller. Unfortunately, I could not for the life of me find out how to throw items using the Classic controller, so I stuck to a sideways Wii remote. The physics are also the same, so if you like the movement in Wii, you'll have no problem here. The first location you'll visit is Yoshi's Island. The theming is a bit standard, but one thing that stands out is Yoshi is far more utilized. He appears in far more levels and even has some different colors. Wow, it's Barney! I'm getting a sneaking suspicion that that orange Yoshi has an unhealthy obsession with Pac-Man and the Mario Kart arcade games. Unfortunately, you can't take Yoshi out of levels. Since this is a modification, I'm sure there were a few limitations. But considering Yoshi is much more prevalent, it's not a huge issue. The first few locations consist of typical Mario locales, but the good news is that many levels do something new. The fortress in Yoshi's Island is a tree with honeycomb you can climb. Rubble Runes is actually a hybrid world, 
consisting of the desert, deep caverns, and even sewers. After all, aren't the Mario Brothers plumbers? And Mushroom Peaks is a cloudy mountainous region with rolling hills. Mushroom Peaks is actually quite significant because it introduces a new power-up to the game, the Hammer Flower. Even though the Tanuki suit is widely considered the best power-up in Mario 3, the Hammer Brothers suit has always been my favorite. It's a pretty underrated power-up, and I'm very glad that this is a power-up newer team decided to bring back. The Hammer suit has benefits and weaknesses, just like the Fire and Ice Flower. It's a complete powerhouse being able to take out most enemies, but the hammers are thrown in an arc, so it's not as easy to aim them as it would be with a Fire or Ice Flower. This is good game design. Even though the Hammer Suit is powerful, the Fire and Ice Flower are still useful. The Hammer Suit is the only new power-up, but all the power-ups from Wii return here. Their function is identical, so that means the Mini Mushroom can still secure its place as the worst Mario power-up. Unlike Mario U's only new idea being the Super Acorn power-up, Newer has a ton of new concepts beyond just the power-up. The first few worlds are a bit basic in theming, but after Mushroom Peaks, it's a complete 180. Sakura Village is the next location you'll visit. It's a village fully based on Japan, with cherry blossoms and pagodas. Many recent Mario games have Japan-inspired locations, but this was years before the Switch era. You'll also encounter a familiar face, or maybe not considering we've never seen Shy Guy's face. They're similar to an enemy like Rex where it takes two hits to defeat them. Why Shy Guys have rarely appeared in mainline Mario games is beyond me. There's also a polarizing twist with the Snow World consisting of fire and ice levels. Sometimes they're even combined. And the first secret world takes place during the fall. I won't spoil all the locations, but so many of them are new and memorable. Locations are important, but level design is the most important aspect in a 2D platformer. There's a reason why people love the story mode in Super Mario Maker 2. Levels made by Nintendo are of very high quality, and many levels made by players don't even come close in quality. But I'm happy to say, the levels in newer Super Mario Bros. Wii are very well designed. If you told me the levels were made by Nintendo, I wouldn't have any doubt in my mind. Star Coins also make a return. I love the Star Coins because they add a lot of depth to the level and encourage exploration. They're hidden in places that can be challenging to reach, but not to the point where they're near impossible to find. Mario U had some cryptic secrets, but newer does not. The Star Coins also have a new purpose and are far more useful. They're used as currency to buy items in a shop. If there's a specific item you want, you'll be able to purchase it up front. But if you're a saver, not a spender, the Toad Houses have items too. The issue with the Toad Houses in Wii is that getting items is based solely on luck. But here, the Toad Houses are actual minigames. With enough skill, you'll be able to obtain items. There's nobody to blame but yourself if you lose. The levels may be designed like Wii, but they introduce new concepts and do new things. One of my favorite levels takes place during a storm and you'll have to avoid the dangerous lightning cloud. Being in Florida, this is something I do on a regular basis, but it's awesome to see here. The difficulty maintains a good balance between accessible and challenging. I wonder how the bosses are. All right, I have prepared myself for battle. I am so ready for the countless boom boom battles that I'm about to endure. <laughs> Wait a minute. You're telling me that the game has original bosses? Get the heck out of here. Most of the bosses are completely original. One of my favorites is the Samurai Shy Guy. I can't help but wonder if Nintendo got inspired here. Although the bosses only take three hits, the fights are all different. The first boss is against the giant Fuzzy, and you defeat him by throwing blocks. Reminds me of some of the fights in Donkey Kong 94, and that is a wonderful thing. But my favorite battle is in Freeze Flame Glacier. You're joined by Yoshi to extinguish the lava and ice bubbles. But if you love the Koopalings, they're still here and act as the airship bosses. The bosses are creative, and the fights are a blast. The only thing I would have improved is having the bosses require more hits. Boss fights are an issue even the best Mario games sometimes can't get right, and it's time to retire the three-hit boss fights. Many of the issues I have with New Super Mario Bros. 2 and U were resolved here. Let's see if the presentation is as great as the game itself. Newer looks very similar to the original. Most of the characters look identical, but that isn't a bad thing considering that the models look quite good. The new enemies such as the Shy Guys definitely have more personality to them, but they don't clash with the look of the game. I praise the locations for being creative, and they look excellent as well. 
Most levels in Wii take place during the day, but newer has much more variety with sunny, cloudy, and even stormy levels. Fun throwbacks to retro Mario games are here as well. There's a secret room with not only sprites, but a blurb about the games that all the sprites originated in. Is that a Super Mario Land 2 reference? Newer team? You now have the Demich seal of approval. The only criticism I have with the presentation is that the world map looks a bit flat in some areas. Better textures and a better background would have helped in these areas greatly. Other than that, my only other criticism is a complete nitpick. Hammer Mario should have looked more like Boomerang Mario, but instead of a blue shell and helmet, they'd be green. Super Mario 3D Land released a few years before in 2011, so the modern design was there. But really, the criticisms with the visual presentation are so arbitrary in the grand scheme of things because the overall game looks great. Music is going to be the true test. New Super Mario Bros. 2 and U barely had any new songs, and when there were new songs, they weren't that memorable. But the worst thing is that most of the music is in the wonderful genre of ba cappella. <laughs> If you thought the music in those games was bop bop bad, you're in for a treat here. Newer has a completely revamped soundtrack consisting of new and remixed music. The main theme of Goldwood Forest is a rendition of Maple Treeway, and the boss theme is a rendition of Super Mario Sunshine's boss music. I think it actually sounds even better. <laughs> There are a few tracks that aren't too memorable in the first few levels, but the music never sounds bad. Most of the soundtrack is great and is of very high quality. Newer has a stellar presentation, and it's clear the developers are very passionate about the Mario series. Unlike the other new Super Mario Bros. games, we didn't have any secondary single player modes. The main new feature was the co-op. It's in Newer as well, and works identically. Two players is the most fun, but four players can get a bit chaotic. Still good to have the option regardless. Unfortunately, Newer doesn't have any secondary modes. The multiplayer exclusive coin battle and free-for-all have been removed. But honestly, I seldomly played those modes, and I pretty much always played the multiplayer and the story mode. But don't let the lack of secondary modes fool you into thinking that the game is light in content. There are 128 levels in total, which is nearly twice the amount of levels found in Wii. One of the things I love about New Super Mario Bros. Wii is the replayability. I've 100%ed the game many times, and sure, one of them was because my younger siblings messed up my shiny stars. But regardless, I still go back to the game every now and then, because it's so much fun to play. The same would apply to newer Super Mario Bros. Wii. You'll have a lot to do here, and you're in for a great time. So far we've established New Super Mario Bros. Wii has excellent level design, interesting locations, a great presentation, and a wealth of content. It may be a modification of Wii, but it does many new things and is essentially its own game. So what's the verdict? Newer Super Mario Bros. Wii is everything Mario U should have been. Mario U is a rehash, but newer is a pure extension of Wii, introducing excellent new and returning concepts. It truly showcases that a memorable and creative game can still be made using an existing engine. New Super Luigi U, Newer Super Mario Bros. Wii, and Super Mario 3D World? 2013 was one hell of a year for Mario fans. Newer Super Mario Bros. Wii, without a doubt, gets the ranking a treasure. Treasure Treasure primarily focuses on polarizing, mediocre, and obscure games, so I'd love to hear suggestions for what a series covering games unanimously considered great should be called. I highly recommend playing Newer Super Mario Bros. Wii and it's one of the best 2D Mario games that I've played. I couldn't think of a nicer way to spend the weekend than going to Canada with my pal Demich. How come we haven't done this until now? We had to save up! We're Nintendo YouTubers. We only make a loony to a toonie an hour. Ah, uh, that explains it. You wanna check out the Eton Center? Sounds like a plan. Then after that, let's check out downtown Toronto. Wow, Demish, that trip was incredible. We gotta do this again. Absolutely. They even have these really cool chocolate eggs with toys inside. I got a dozen of them to bring home to the States. Wait. Stop right there! Put your hands in the air! What did I even do? Do you know how dangerous those are? 
A little kid could choke on the toys and the Kinder Eggs! Well, if he did end up choking on them, he probably wasn't gonna go very far in life anyway. Silence! You will be held here until further notice! Take my watch! How do we get back to the States? Right answer, wrong answer, it matters not. What you're saying is 100% factually invalid! He didn't even give you an answer, he gave you a question. If you're Tricky Nick or Demich, suck on it. Oh hell no, I'm not doing that regardless of how long we're held here. Well this stinks, what do we do now? Well, I brought this Nintendo DSi. Is that newer Super Mario Bros. DS? You bet it is! Well, we're stuck here in Canada, why don't we do a retrospective of it together? Invalid- No, I'm kidding. Let's do this! Newer Super Mario Bros. Wii is considered to be one of the best Mario fan games of all time. It took New Super Mario Bros. Wii and expanded on it with all kinds of new ideas, locations, mechanics, and even the return of the hammer suit. But on Christmas of 2017, Santa was bringing down not one, but two amazing Mario modifications. We got Super Mario Land 2 Deluxe being a full color version of the classic Game Boy game. And along with that, we got a sequel to newer Super Mario Bros. Wii, newer Super Mario Bros. DS. Considering how much I love that game, I was very excited that it got a sequel. I will admit, I was a little bit surprised to find out it wasn't made for the Wii, but in this case, while we're held in Canada, the fact that it's a DS game is definitely beneficial. So kick back, grab your Timmies and catch up lays as we dive into the world of newer Super Mario Bros. DS. Our story begins with Bowser Jr. capturing Peach and the Mario Brothers have to save her. Go figure. I'm not a fan of this cliche story considering it's been done more times than I mentioned Nintendo Switch Sports and Mario Strikers Battle League, but I've come to expect it. But like I always say, an interesting story is nice to have, but it doesn't really matter much in a 2D Mario game. The gameplay is the most important factor. The core gameplay is similar to that of the original New Super Mario Bros. Considering this is a modification of that game, it makes sense. But unlike the original, Mario and Luigi have different abilities. Mario plays the same, but Luigi is given his signature high jump, but weaker traction. He even does the air kicks. He controls similarly to how he did in New Super Luigi U, rather than in the Lost Levels, and trust me, that is a great thing, considering that in the Lost Levels, he is nearly unusable. Between the brothers, you bet Luigi is the one I like more. It's safe to say that if Luigi is playable, I'll always choose him over Mario, but other than the different abilities, the core movement remains the same as the original, and just like any new Super Mario Bros. game, the Mario Brothers can use power-ups to extend their abilities. The classic Super Mushrooms, Fire Flowers, and Super Stars are here. The Mega Mushroom remains as cool as ever, and it's actually utilized far more. And the Mini Mushroom remains as not cool as ever. I have many questions for whoever thought it was a good idea, for not one, not two, but four new Super Mario Bros. games to retain it. Why keep one of the worst power-ups in every game, only to then ditch one of the coolest power-ups after one game? The often misunderstood Blue Shell Power-Up. It only appeared in the first game, but running with it, Mario and Luigi essentially have the properties of a Koopa shell, being able to take out enemies you can't with the Fire Flower. The reason why people didn't like it is because you can't run normally with it, meaning that if you don't bother to learn how the movement works with it, you'll be constantly ricocheting off walls. The good news is that my beloved blue shell doesn't return. The good news is that a refined version of the hammer suit does. Gosh, with that tautology going on, I feel like that Diego guy. The hammer suit here is similar to how it was in newer Wii. It's different from the Fire Flower due to it being more powerful, but the hammers are thrown in an arc rather than directly at enemies. This is excellent game design because it justifies having both the hammer and the Fire Flower, but unlike in newer Wii, Mario and Luigi can use the shell dash after sliding down a slope. It also retains the abilities of being able to swim faster, even though I like the blue shell, the hammer suit is far better and is way more refined. You're essentially getting two awesome power-ups in one. The main difference between the blue shell and the hammer suit being that you can run with the hammer suit normally, whereas with the blue shell, you'd automatically do the shell dash. With the hammer suit, you can only do that when you go down the slopes. It's the only new power-up in the game, 
but considering the limitations of a modification, it may have only been possible to include just that one over the blue shell, and this is more than made up for by just how powered up the game is. One of my main gripes with the new Super Mario Bros. games is how the world themes are the same in every game, but in newer DS, most of the themes are either brand new or make existing themes something really cool. You'll start off in Gold Leaf Plains. This is an entire world themed around autumn. It was a secret world in newer Super Mario Bros. Wii, but here it's a main world. With falling leaves and maple trees, it's quite fitting considering that we're in Canada. Newer team, you're miles ahead of the game. Maple Miles. The next world is very underground, quite literally being crystal sewers. This is where the hammer suit is introduced. There are colorful stalagmites similar to Mario U's underground levels, but it's elaborated on into a much greater extent. And things only get cooler from here, or should I say warmer, considering how the snow world is a fire and ice hybrid. It's essentially taking Freeze Flame Galaxy and turning it into an entire world, but in 2D this time. But by far my favorite world is Pumpkin Boneyard. New Super Mario Bros. had half of the final world go for a haunted theme, but it didn't go all the way with it. But in newer DS, it's essentially an entire world based around Halloween and it's totally spooktacular. I never thought my love for Halloween and new Super Mario Bros. DS would be combined so seamlessly, but it was. We won't showcase all of the world themes so you can experience them for yourself. But outside of the beach world being a bit standard, the themes are very creative and really add to a newer experience. Having awesome locations already gives newer DS quite the edge, but the true test is going to be with the level design. I mean, just because I'm in a pit of bones filled with pumpkins doesn't mean I'm gonna enjoy it. The level design is excellent though. The level design is definitely more similar to Wii than the original New Super Mario Bros. DS, with larger, more open levels, but not so large to the point where there are empty sections and a lack of focus. All the levels feel organic and have an excellent difficulty balance, they have challenge, but they aren't brutal. In other words, the difficulty is just right. But where newer DS really shines is with the variety. Many levels have mechanics you wouldn't ever expect from New Super Mario Bros. There are a few Donkey Kong Country style minecart levels, and although they're very similar to the ones in Donkey Kong, they're still a blast to play. There are many levels that introduce clever and fun mechanics, with one of the world specifically centering around one, but hands down my favorite level in the game is Cloud Bolt Chasm. The fact that it's a great auto-scrolling level already makes it a champion, but what brings it to the ranking of godlike is the Thundercloud being an enemy. You'll have to avoid lightning bolts from the Thundercloud enemy, but he can break obstacles as well. Just seeing the most underrated Mario Kart item that happened to originate in one of the most underrated Mario games makes me love this level even more. But in addition to the great levels, there are also three star coins to find in each of the levels. What makes the Star Coins great is that they add so much depth to the levels too. They encourage exploration and showcase just how much a level can offer. Their function remains the same as being a key to 100%ing the game as well as being used as a currency to purchase toad houses. That's not very fun, but it's okay. There are also many secret exits and secret levels to find as well. In some games, secret areas can be obnoxiously hidden. Ahem, <clears throat> new Super Mario Bros. You with your invisible walls? But here, they're in places that are hidden, but make sense. So far, everything about this game is pretty perfect, but there's only one criticism I have. The bosses are mostly identical to the ones in the original New Super Mario Bros. It's definitely better than the Koopalings, but considering the excellent bosses in newer Wii, this is a bit of a disappointment. Especially considering how cool the few but new original boss fights are. But in the grand scheme, that's just a nitpick of a game that's overall incredible. The presentation of newer Super Mario Bros. DS is similar to that of the original, but it's refined to look even better. The original used pre-rendered sprites for the enemies that looked fine, but definitely looked a bit out of place. They're still pre-rendered here, but they look so much better. The Koopas even come in blue, and when blue Koopas are in a game, that means it's gonna be something great. We've already discussed how cool the world themes are, and the presentation for them really does the themes justice. They go all out with them, and there's a really great attention to detail. It's clear newer team were passionate about what they were making, and this is also apparent with the music. A lot of it consists of remixed Mario music. Considering this is on the DS, it had to be compressed into a cheese-it. But not to the point where the music is so damn cheesy that it's hilarious. But what newer team did was really cool. 
They use the sound fonts of Pokemon DS games. What the heck? The music is of very high quality and fits right in with Mario games though. And there are new sound effects as well, the entire presentation is excellent and really showcases just how passionate fans are. Newer Super Mario Bros. DS does not have the Mario vs. Luigi mode and mini games from the original, but considering you probably already have the original, it's not even a big deal. The content comes down to the amount of levels and the replay value. As stated before, there are many secret exits and star coins to find, and considering there are about 80 different levels, newer DS will keep you occupied. It's about the length of New Super Mario Bros. Wii, longer than the original on DS, but not as long as newer Wii, and even so, that is an absolutely perfect length. So in regards to content, newer DS has an ample amount. So far we've established newer Super Mario Bros. DS is essentially perfect in every way, but the bosses could have been better, and that's not even an issue in the grand scheme of the game. What do you think the verdict's gonna be? Newer Super Mario Bros. DS is everything a 2D Mario game should be. Take notes, Nintendo. The level design is great, the locations are unique, topped off with a stellar presentation and high replay value, and you got yourself one of the best 2D Mario experiences out there. And the great thing is, is that it's portable, making our time in Canada go by much faster. How do you feel, Demich? I definitely agree with you there. But the main question now is, which is better? Newer Super Mario Bros. Wii or Newer Super Mario Bros. DS? Both are incredible games, but Newer DS has the edge, thanks to the better level design and the new mechanics found in levels. Newer Super Mario Bros. DS gets the ranking of treasure. Alright, Circus Miles, enough is enough, you invalid excuse of a Mountie. No, you can't leave until you... Wait, are you Tricky Nick or the Meech? I used to think you guys were factually wrong. I still kind of do. But you know what? You guys are pretty cool. Wait, what? Tell you what? You guys can go. But how about a round of new Super Mario Bros. minigames before you go? Well, that is a strange turn of events, but you know what? I'll take it. You're alright. Care for some ketchup lays and timmies? <laughs> <laughs>